Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and this month we're returning to our annual Teshuva series, where we talk all about repentance, change, transformation, and everything in between. Thank you so much to our series sponsors, once again, our dearest friends, Mira and Daniel Stokar. I'm so grateful for your your friendship. Thank you so much for sponsoring this series. And thank you so much to our episode sponsor, who was sponsored anonymously. I don't want to give hints about who this person is, but he's a dear friend, somebody who I've worked with in the past and was very kind and gracious to sponsor this episode. I'm so grateful, especially to friends who come and support the work that we're doing. So thank you so much. And hope we have you on the show one day imitating Moishi. This podcast is part of a larger exploration of those big, juicy Jewish ideas. So be sure to check out 1840.org where you can also find videos, articles, and recommended readings. I want to actually begin our entire Teshuva series by doing a little bit of Teshuva of my own. It's not for the most serious sin, but it's something that I kind of honestly I let a friend down, somebody who we had on the show. We had during our Books, Books, book series, my dearest friend, Srili Besser. And part of you know why I thought it was so important to have him on the show was because of this WhatsApp group that he runs called Mi Ka'amcha Yisroel. Mi Ka'amcha Yisroel, it's a WhatsApp group, it's on social media, and essentially the phrase Mi Ka'amcha Yisroel means who is like your nation, O Israel. And what it does is exactly that. It shares little clips and videos of really just everyday Jews, not just celebrities, not just famous rabbis, but everyday Jews doing incredible things to remind you how incredible and how special it is the privilege to be a part of the Jewish people. I happen to love the account. I sometimes tease the account, but I mostly nearly all of the time love the account. I'm in their WhatsApp group and I follow them on social media and I hope you do too. And you can check them out on social media at MKY, the letters MKY status. But more importantly, I was supposed to plug their social media and their WhatsApp group because it is such a beautiful account. And you know what? I need these reminders. I'm sure everybody needs these reminders. So often it can be easy to, you know, slip into a cynical mentality where you're like, ugh, this is the worst, just a more obligations, more commitment. Your love of other everyday Jews begins to erode. And I find this account incredibly inspiring. But one thing I forgot to do was actually tell people how to become a part of it. And I felt really bad about that. And we're kicking off a new series. And I figured, why not just do it right up front? So really check them out on social media. It's at MKY status, or you could join their WhatsApp group. That's 845-330-3445. Again, 845-330-3445. It's so wonderful to be a part of the Jewish people. Really, ordinary Jews doing extraordinary things and really please check them out and it actually is a pretty reasonable intro to our guest today because the phrase Mika Amcha Yisrael who is like you among the Jewish people it's not just a phrase that we find in Tanakh you know it can be found in Divrei Hayamim this phrase and it's the phrase that the Talmud tells us quite movingly that in the tefillin that so to speak God himself wears inside of those tefillin instead of talking about God like we we have an hour tefillin. God wears a pair of tefillin. We're in those tefillin. He talks about Mika Amcha Yisroel, has the psukim, has the verses that talk about how special, how uplifted the nation of Israel is. And I think it's very easy to look at the Jewish people at times and forget that. You see people who are committed to davening, to studying Torah, to Shabbos, to all of these things, and it's very easy to forget and just focus on all the ways that Jews have disappointed you. And very often when you're around people who are so close to you, the people who are going to disappoint you the most are the ones who are the closest to you. So it's a very necessary reminder, and in many ways it's the entire mission, it's the entire purpose of our guest today, Rev. Dani. Neil Kalish, who is affiliated with the Yeshiva of Waterbury, but he really does so, so much more. And my story with him really begins much before my connection to Rev. Daniel Kalish. I feel obligated to share a little bit about how not just I, but my family is connected to his because it really sheds light on what our interview is all about and what our conversation is all about. The first time I ever spoke to Rev. Daniel Kalish on the phone was on a Saturday night. 
a Motzei Shabbos where I was calling him. I think I was calling him to come to a different event, to maybe like an NCSY event. I was trying to get through to him. I hadn't really heard that many of his shiurim until then. I was familiar with the yeshiva of Waterbury, which looking back, I used to, you know, tease, joke around about a little bit on social media. And I figured I'll give him a call, get through to him. I got his cell phone number. I left a message. Nobody picks up a stray uh, cell phone number. I don't. I didn't expect him to. Uh, And I figured, you know, I'll get in touch with him, you know, in a few days from now. And what was so remarkable is that he called me around uh, five minutes later. It was like very quickly. I was honestly shocked. You know, this is a person who has hundreds, if not thousands of Talmidim students across the world. But he called me back right away. And I think the reason why he called me back has nothing to do with me, but because our story really begins with our parents. The Rabbi Kalish I grew up with was not Rev. Daniel Kalish, but actually his father, Rev. Yehoshua Kalish. Rabbi Kalish was the rabbi in the minion that I used to daven in and with my father in the downstairs of Share. And he was a remarkable person. He gave the Dafyomi, the daily study of Talmud, in the shul that I was affiliated with growing up in Share Tefillah. And I remember here, I think he would always give it on Shabbos afternoon. He would give this wonderful Dafyomi shir. My father, I think, did two, three cycles of Dafyomi and nearly exclusively with Rabbi Kalish. And Rabbi Kalish was very famous because most people, when they do Dafyomi, it takes them seven and a half years to finish the entire Talmud. If you do one page a day, and when I say one page, I mean two sides of one page, what's known as a Daf, it takes seven and a half years to study the Talmud. Rabbi Kalish was famous. I remember among us kids, we would always talk about it. He would finish, I believe still continues to finish the entire Talmud every single year, which means that he's studying about seven and a half pages a day, which even if you're, even if you're just reading the words, you don't know the translation. That's still a lot of time. He knows the words. He knows the translation. He knows everything that goes in between. To do seven and a half pages a day and finish all of Talmud is something that is absolutely remarkable. And our families became closer. I remember because my father took care of Rabbi Kalish's, I think, sister-in-law, or maybe even sister. Her name was Rebetzin Tova Fine. She is Rev. Daniel Kalish's aunt. And I even think my father kept a picture of her, I think, in our house that we would just keep in mind to daven for. My father, as I've mentioned a thousand and one times, is an oncologist. And unfortunately, she succumbed to her illness. But I remember it brought our families closer together. You know, I don't know all of my father's patients. You know, they're obviously uh, HIPAA violations. But when you live in a community where, you know, everybody's close-knit and people are coming by on weeknights after Shabbos on Sunday nights to talk about, you know, what's going on with their family, with their illness, with their treatment. So if you live in that home, you begin to know, you know, certain patients, not all of them, but you begin to know, you know, kind of who they are. And uh, Tova Fine was definitely somebody who was a presence in our home and somebody who I know my father was very close to and worked very hard to treat. Unfortunately, she passed, but our families became much closer. You know, it wasn't just a face in the shul. You know, I was a young kid at the time, but I became very close with Rev. Daniel Kalish's father. I remember he had voice issues. He had a very hoarse voice. And I believe the story that I was at least told is that when his father passed away, if you're keeping track of all the uh, Rabbi Kalish's in this story, that would be Rev. Daniel Kalish's grandfather. He urged Rabbi Kalish to take voice lessons so he wouldn't struggle so much when he's giving over Torah. And I remember he would come in shul and he would be practicing his voice exercises. He had a much deeper voice so it didn't put so much pressure on his throat. And I remember that as a kid, just this person. And I I found it really remarkable, somebody who's in there, I don't know, he's probably in his 50s at the time, reinventing themselves, literally speaking with a new voice. Uh, something that I found incredibly remarkable. But when Rev. Daniel Kalish called me on that Motzi Shabbos, we actually began with this. We began with our family connection with our fathers. And my father and Rev. Yoshua Kalish are very different people. My father does not uh, finish the Talmud every year, though I'm sure he would like to and want to. But he's a very serious person. My father also studies Torah. My father wakes up very early to learn. He's not a rabbi. He's retired now. But my father and Rev. Yoshua Kalish had something in common. This is what Rev. Daniel Kalish told me, and I found it so remarkable when we were talking about our parents. He said, our parents came from a generation where you were able to put your head down and you were able to grind and have this daily commitment that really so many in our generation, it's not out of reach, but it's not quite as natural. There weren't people who once they make that commitment, 
grind, the daily in and out grind, waking up early, finding time to learn. This is something that, again, I grew up, I saw my father do it. It seemed very natural to me until I tried to do it. And then it became very, very difficult getting out of bed, finding time, having a routine, having a daily schedule. My father is regimented. This is a person, while he's not finishing all of Talmud every year, but he is getting out of bed the same exact time every day. He's showing up to the base medrash every single time the same exact day. There were years where he was having the same lunch every single day. I remember he'd have this cabbage, maybe with like tuna. It was like very low key. Maybe he even got it from the Sunshine Cafe. He started buying his own cabbage, but he was a regimented person. He was able to kind of put his head down and the growth was very slow and steady, but over many, many years. And what Rev. Daniel Kalish told me, which I found really remarkable and really true, is that this quality is something that this generation is struggling mighty with. We have a generation who's growing up where the path of Jewish commitment, the path of Frumkite, the path of committed religiosity day in and day out, kind of in a way has already been forged. It was the previous generation who on their shoulders, previous two generations, people who were born in you know the 40s and 50s, people, it was much more rare, their parents, that generation wasn't even American born for most people. My grandparents are probably the exception. All four of my grandparents were born in the United States between 1915 and around 1921. But for most people, like if you were born in, I don't know, in the 90s, in the 80s, and my students now born in the 2000s, the path of committed religiosity in many ways feels like has already been paved. The path is already there. And that has some wonderful consequences. It's much easier. It's easier than ever to be from, to be committed, to be religious in a serious way, committed day in day out. It's probably never easier. There's no generation who has struggled less in terms of keeping kosher, in terms of finding a minion and finding Torah opportunities. Our generation has them in abundance because there was a generation that committed themselves to build these pathways. But there's something that I think there's a difficulty that has emerged from this, and I heard this in that conversation on that Motsi Shabbos with Rev. Daniel Kalish, and that is people when you walk on a paved road, the excitement, the sense of ownership is not the same like walking through through a forest and building a path of your own. You know, leaving aside people who donate uh, highways and put their name on highways, you don't have the same ownership as if you were blazing a trail for the first time. And the fact that the modern religious world feels like a paved highway, it feels like it was already done, all the yellow lines are there, all the white lines are there, and it's very easy to kind of move in and out of traffic and you're just kind of like, you know, waiting for the light to turn green and just go and the paths are already there. Keep kosher, Shabbos opportunities, learning opportunities, davening opportunities, like it's all there. And I think for a lot of people in this generation, myself very much included, you're kind of struggling with like, how do I find my own sense of ownership? How do I find my own pathway in my religious life? And it was this question that Rev. Daniel Kalish, and he told me, I'm, I'm going to say something that people are going to think is insane. I don't think Rev. Daniel Kalish would deny it, but he told me on the phone, he said, look, I think what you and I are doing doing is very similar. That doesn't mean that he agrees with everything that 1840 has ever done, but he saw a commonality in what we are doing. And the way that he expressed it, and it was like so moving, I didn't expect him to have ever heard of 1840, let alone have listened to it with his own students. But he told me he had. And what he found, I think what resonated with him is the fact that what we are both trying to do is help people really embrace their own story, really find a way where their religious lives feel like they have only ownership over this pathway. It's not a highway that only other people are made, only other people are allowed to pave, only other people are allowed to paint the lines on, but we can create and forge our own paths and have ownership over them and really find our own story, something that he repeats over and over again, really learning to embrace your own story and your own religious life in a way that because it's become so easy, because it's become so almost predetermined in a way it feels, to give people back and to allow them to make sense of how their story coheres with all of the highways that have been paved by previous generations and still allow them to find a path in their own religious life, in their own personal life, in their own emotional life to experientially feel that Yiddishkeit belongs to me. It is part of my story. Everything that I've been through is a part of my story. 
is really what makes him a generational educator and such an important person to really kick off our series on Teshuva. Teshuva, if nothing else, is about returning to the self. Uh, it means to return, and we return to ourself, and in a way, we return to God through that return to ourselves. And that return to ourselves means learning to embrace our stories, learning to embrace the trajectory of our lives, and figure out how everything that you've been through, everything that you've faced all the challenges of religious life can be integrated into a path, an old path that's a new path, a new path that's an old path, but a path that uniquely belongs to you and your relationship with God and with the Jewish people and with Jewish tradition. So I'm really so excited to share this conversation with Rev. Daniel Kalish, but I want to make one important note before we listen in on this conversation. And that's something that's really remarkable about Rev. Daniel Kalish. If you've ever met him in person, he came to speak at one event. He does something that is incredible that if you were to hear it for the first time or to see it for the first time, it catches you so off guard. You're like, is this really what we're doing here? He, at least the times that I've seen him, does not travel alone. He travels with students. The students are a part of his story and he is a part of their story. And he travels with students and he doesn't just have them, you know, sit on the side and, you know, kind of like bask in what he is saying. No, no siree. When he came to speak at an NCSY event with NCSY staff and leadership, he had them set up, I believe, like four microphones. He said, I want my students to be able to speak. I want my students to be able to sing. Singing, as we'll hear at the end, is a very foundational part of the Yeshiva of Waterbury. They've really produced some incredible songs, many of which I listen to in car rides. He's listening sometimes to 1840 in his car rides, and I am nearly always listening to songs from uh, the Waterbury Yeshiva. But so much of what he's about is handing the microphone actually to his own students and letting them participate in the conversation. This is a generation who does not just want to be spoken to. They also want to share and discover and grapple with their own stories. So a part of this conversation actually included Rev. Daniel Kalish's students. I visited his base medrash in Durnbury. I forgot what it's called. It's not actually in Waterbury. And we spoke in the base medrash actually together and we sang together. It was very beautiful. And afterwards we recorded and he brought his students along with him. He brought a, a select group of students to talk about the experience of what Waterbury is. I've always been moved. I started taking it for granted and I needed to pause for a second. It was almost to say what we began with this Mika Amcha Yisrael moment of a Rebbe who is traveling with his students, not so they can listen in, but so they can speak. They also have a story. They also have something to share. They also have a path through the woods, through the forest, through the caves of life that they have traversed and we can all benefit from listening to what they've grappled with and what they've struggled with. So it is really my absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce our conversation with Rev. Daniel Kalish and, of course, his students. You and I, we look like we live in two very different universes, but we came from literally the same world. Your father was the Dafyoimi Magadshir for my father for three cycles. My father is a public school graduate. He grew up, him, my grand father, my great-grandfather, are from North Adams, Massachusetts, the Berkshires. In North Adams, Massachusetts, the Hall of Fame, like who are the, f who's come out of North Adams, Massachusetts? Like who would you think? The Hall of Fame. So the most famous person I believe is Susan B. Anthony. I think she lived there for a little bit, but really the most famous in the last hundred years were the creators of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And they have like an exhibit. They have like an exhibit. And what drew my father into learning when I drove up with Akiva, he asked like, who got my father to where he is? I said two people. I said my mother's father, Rabbi Bekritsky, I don't know if you ever met him. He was in the first graduating class of Chafetz Chaim. So he learned by Rav David Leibovitch. He learned by Rav Trago Feivel. His mashkiach was Rav Scheinberg. And I said the Rebbe that really brought him to Yiddishkeit was really Rabbi Kalish. Rabbi Kalish, like, really fashioned him. And my father was a, I don't like using the word because it's still the opposite of everything we talk, but I'll use it because that's how somebody would describe a machine. Wakes up, 3.50, 4 o'clock. It got earlier and earlier. 4 a.m., learns for two and a half hours, goes to minion and then he's like in the off 
office curing cancer by 9 a.m. And, you know, your father, obviously a legend, finishing Shas every year. And my impression is, is that there was a generation who were able to operate like this and something changed. And I want to hear from you. You know the world that we both came from. Not only that we both came from, but your father, in a, in a way, fashioned the world that my father brought me up in. And I see this like twilight period where we seem like there's a new world coming in and there's not a setting, but a new iteration of that. What do you see as changing? What is the distinction between the generation that we came from and the generation that we're trying to reach now? The question's cool and it's such an important question. It's a hard question. I think we share this. We both have a tremendous, to say respect is an understatement because our parents, anything we're doing, any of our work, any of our life's mission stands on the shoulders of our parents. When I say our fathers learned together, so my just talking politely, my father gave the shear. So why did I say that I'm not trying to be cute? And the guys were an honest place, and I say they learned together. I should say he was in my father's shear. I say they learned together not being cute. I really got that from my father. My wife couldn't believe it when she married in the family. My father talks about this group that he learned with, Dr. Bashevkin. There's somebody, a helper at Mishpacha, this family, Mr. Harvey Halpert. So I told you my parents' number one dream was for me to be a Balkare. Harvey Halpert's son was my Balkare teacher, the Ellie. one, Ellie. Ellie's one of my best friends from the Chabrusas for years. So if you ever ask him about the Talmud that got away, you know what I'm saying? I used to go every Motzi Shabbos and learn how to lane with Ellie Halpert. And Arlene and my mother are, we came from the same world. Arlene, we come from the same world. Arlene and my mother are our mamish best friends. They're, wow, they're, wow. Yeah. There's many more families that were part. Mr. Sam Bergman was part of this group for many, many years. It was a larger group and I say my father learned with them the way he speaks about this crew, the respect, the tremendous respect. The Gemara Nadarim says that a lot of time Talmud Chum's kids are not Talmud Chachamim. If you can believe it, Nadarim is one of my favorite Masechtas and Shas. It's the only Masechta I learned cover to cover with my dad. There's no other Masechta. How awkward, maybe, is to learn with your father a Gemara which asks that why are Talmud Chum's kids not Talmud Chum often? And I just learned that Gemara with my dad. I learned the whole Masechta. It's a little awkward. And the Gemara gives six reasons, I believe. One of the reasons gives me a lot of hope in my own life because one of the sixth reasons says that because Talmud Chum called people Chamayrim. They call people donkeys. And if any way your Torah learning makes you look down at others, your kids are not Talmud Chum. Don't look at it as an Einish, as a punishment. The Gemara is saying something deep. And if your kids are not Talmud Chum, it means it's not deeply you. Like Rav Tzaddik, Rav David's a big chas, Rav Tzaddik says your kids are your deepest secrets. Your kids are not Talmud Chum means you don't really have it. That's what it means. So the Gemara says, you know, when you don't keep Torah, it's not you, it doesn't go to your kids. The Gemara says if you call people Chamer. My father father all the years, his respect for the people he learned with, he spoke glowing. My wife like wanted to meet these people. And your father amongst them, there was no pretend to it. And when I say over the history, I say they learned together because the mutual respect was just real. How he was saying the sheer, my father, but he speaks about people like in the most, not just speaks about them, the attitude and the truth of him looking up and speaking in the highest esteem of this group was how I grew up. What I want to say, and what both of us is a struggle. Anything we have is on the shoulders of the previous generation. The danger of a generation that would look down at a previous generation is crazy. We believe closer to the Harsinai. The respect for, I think about my grandmother, my Oma's, anything we build is just after she did what she did. My father had wonderful, my grandparents were amazing people. My father was in a mixed school and decided to become a Bentai to TV in every room and didn't watch for 10 years, decided he wants something different, anything my siblings and I do was on his shoulder and is because of his successes. So when we're going to have a conversation about today's generation, it's not just like give the obligatory, of course, they were chasher before. No, no, no. It has to be like stated with such care that it's built on the previous generations what they did. And every generation has a task, a duty, a responsibility. What we grew up in, what I saw, I went through high school. I love my rebellion. This is not a knock. They were doing what was supposed to be then. And I never once said to a Rebbe, I feel insecure. I was a 
people pleaser. I never once, op- not I didn't open up to a Rebbe, I never thought about it. It wasn't spoken about, people pushed. You learned the next blot, you pushed hard. It was amazing the accomplishments of a generation that pushed to learn, to accomplish, to be bigger, to be better. And that was an incredible amount of accomplishments that people did and brought us incredible places. You have a generation today and I'm like tapping in, trying to tap in. We're sitting with a whole bunch of guys here that I want Rabbi Shevkin to meet, I want everybody to meet, who are my Rebbeim in this aspect of feeling. I realize and I'm realizing how many walls I built myself. When I say feeling and getting in touch, I mean, I'm not just saying to do emotions. I don't consider, well, I'm not so into emotions. I'm not the touchy-feely type. I just call it honesty. To get to very deep places inside of us, to acknowledge and recognize, you spoke to the guys before, that story in Portland and this is what like we connected on this point of really feeling our stories we're sitting right now around the table we're a group of people around the table when I tell people know your story and know your kids story you sound like a comedian know my story I can tell you I went first grade second grade third grade the story we're all in this room we're not in the same 10 people in this room that we have different stories. I'm sitting here hoping this sounds okay, a hoping thing that I'm thinking. Right, Bashevkin's hoping Kalish says something half smart. <laughs> I is hoping they don't ask me this. What am I going to share? So our story is not what's happening externally. It's very nuanced inside. Kids today are feeling real. If I could share a story that happened in Yeshiva, there's not a stitch of exaggeration to what I'm about to share. I want to say it delicately. I'm not going to give all the details. Details, but I'm going to give the details that I can give, and this is just what happened. There was a guy who came to Yeshiva who wouldn't daven, but a macha, he would not daven. He would sit in shul, he's a disciplined kid, would sit in shul, wouldn't daven. Beshita. I was very close to him, I am very close to him, really close. A tremendous yedidos. And I thought I wanted to be like just gently, I want to show him that he could say a little, maybe like he has an all or nothing part to him. So I wanted to literally show him by Mayriv that there's something like say Shema. Like every year, you know, Shema, say this paragraph of Shema, the first paragraph. I wanted to show him it's not all or nothing. There's something called, so I say Shema. So I give him a Siddur and I just show him like as, like we're close, I open the Siddur, like say this. And I wasn't saying like as a way of getting to play, just say this, like to say Shema, it's worth to be born. He got very emotional and just shook it up and like waved me off. And after davening, he started crying. I can picture it now. And he said, Rebbe, don't ever do that to me again. Don't ever do that again. Very shaken, a very honest, real person. What is he talking about? What did I do? Now you could just wave off kids today. Huh? It's easy to wave people off kids today. They're not, but he's not. The problem is that he's not nuts. He's a very cool kid, very smart, very sophisticated. What did I do? We both talked about it. He was allergic to pretend. He went through a lot in his life. The word contrived. And when we say just be a decent kid, like do it, we go into shul and just shock a little. Like what's the de- what's your deal? Like can you be like the rest of us? His story brought him there, and he's a kid of today. He's allergic to pretend. And I said, just say this, don't ever do that. I thought in you I can find somebody who gets I want real. Now, when I say that, all of us have pretend places. There's nothing wrong with trying. We all have aspects of that, but the base, the goal, the focus has to be real. In authenticity, this guy today prays, and I promise not every shakal is real, but there's an authenticity to him. This guy today has a connection to Shabbos. I don't know in my life. I've seen Gedolim. I don't know in my life. I can't weigh it, but when I I'm around him, somebody's attachment to Shabbos, he waits all week for Shabbos, I could describe a Shabbos, and he's formed an attachment to Yiddishkeit that's deep, that's profound, because he wants to feel, he wants to connect. That's what I see in the generation. And in contrast, it hit me that like our parents' generation had this uncommon ability, this drive to do what you need to do, to get it done. And they were the first generation post-Holocaust. My father was born in 47. I don't know if you want to announce the year your father was born right now. And they had this ability to drive, to drive. And then we 
community, they built this like kind of edifice of Yiddishkeit institutions, yeshivas, schools that they, my father did not grow up in this world. And it sounds like our generation now was playing catch up to make sure that the edifice of the system that we built still has the soulfulness that we have. Now, I'm curious, and I want to kind of like name the monster that we're talking about. You have a very popular following. People find you very moving because you've seen this transition. And people probably have an idea of what Waterbury looks like and feels like in concept, like the Waterbury Shalmala of heaven, the heavenly Waterbury. They come in and they see the kid who was struggling and now he's in the base medrash and he's learning and he's like really intense right now. And I'll be honest, you come here and like there's still messiness. It's messy. It's messy. It's not that the greatness of Waterbury is like it takes a non- non-typical kid and then it, it fast tracks them into you know like button down shirt and it, it's still messy I'm looking around you know you have a lot of students here we've got some t-shirts we've got even the button down shirts have a fabric that has an unusual I first want to ask what is your relationship to Waterbury's reputation does it bother you that there's a reputation there's the rabbi Rev Daniel like we love him we love him and we love listening to his Torah but then when they drive up and they see it here and they actually talk about Waterbury you you could hear even in the voice sometimes. Like, uh, water, it becomes an adjective. And I'm curious for you, what's your relationship to that? Like, sometimes there are Tamili Chacham and there are great Jewish leaders like Rabbi Salavechik would always say, they only want my mind, but they don't want my heart. And like, I'm curious for you, do you ever feel like they only want your 30-minute nice ideas on the Parsha, but they don't actually want to love your actual Talmidim? They don't actually want to send their own kids to Waterbury, God forbid. You know, like, <gasps> how do you deal with the reputation of Waterbury? Well, that's a packed question. I want to talk to you about two aspects of the question. Firstly, I want to say that I care a lot about reputation. I want people to like the yeshiva as much as I want. By nature, I'm a people pleaser, and a people pleaser wants to be liked, and I want the yeshiva to be liked, what it is to be appreciated. I've made a commitment and a decision not to focus on that. It's dangerous to put reputation in front. Very, very dangerous. And reputation matters. There's sources in the Torah. Everything's from the Torah matters, but I made a decision, but like written in blood, that I will put reality over perception, because how much is sacrificed by how it looks? I think it goes right into what people say is the goal, like how does it look at the end? People come here, it's interesting, there's a magical component of Simcha that's here, you're here, there's an energy, that, this is a school I, in people's lives, have you ever seen in an honest way the happiness that's here? There's an energy of growth that's magical. To say it looks neat and easy, that's not a truth of our lives. People send their kids as if, and people are afraid to send their kids, as if like the goal is like you have a new manipulative way to get that end game of what the school, they have their way. The school couldn't get a kid to a certain place. Let's have a different trick to get him To there. get them to that. What about that we all have a soul and could we be honest and just there? Could we just be ourselves? Could we just really be... And it might not look what a parent wants, but can we just be ourselves, this beautiful self, and ourself with, with our pains, with our history, with our stories, but just be a reflection of the self. And it's not an end game of, well, oh, now you look the part. Many people have tried to make Waterberries, but will negate certain dangers that are here. What it is, is in honesty, you are safe being you. It's a very unique place. I consider it the safest place on earth. Because I call safety is different than the system. You're safe being you. And I'm learning from it myself. And even at the cost of it not looking pretty, it's not designed to look pretty for other people. Though I do say when people come, they see aspects that are, whoa, there's a happiness that exists here. The word chios, there's an energy, there's life. The life of somebody who's being true to themselves, the life of somebody who's honestly growing. So I do want people to see it. One of the knocks on Waterbury is if will take this place is designed for Mitsuyanim not in a joke my own four sons have been here the guys around this table I think many of our kids of Klai Yisrael should come here I dare say all and I get in trouble for that if you're safe listen if you're helping our struggling kids we're so proud of you this guy's nuts he feels and the answer is I was asked I'll tell you a true story I wanted a guy I didn't tell the guys I wanted a guy to be a dorm counselor in yeshiva thought it'd be good for him 
he meets with me, and his Rebbe coached him for the meeting. He said his water bear has one question. The Rebbe told him to ask me, is water bear l'chatchilo b'dyeved? Is it ideal, or is it like a second? Yeah. yeah. I said it's ideal. He said, my Rebbe told me that I shouldn't come. Did that hurt you? How do you react as an individual? It's painful. Of course it's painful because of what I want the yeshiva to give and to be. I want it to be a place of biko she'emes. And to say honesty is not ideal, that's complicated. When you ask the personally, does it hurt? That we all grow, you know, we all grow in our own journeys. There's a person very separate from the yeshiva. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, you know, that would change younger and older. I'm at a different place in my life than when I was younger. But for what I want the yeshiva to be, the yeshiva is not a place to help a struggling kid. Not at all. It's not that's not how you look at it. Like zero. This. Zero, no. It's a place that, there's a place on earth that you could be honest. That a guy can come here. I'm trying to plug into it myself. This whole place happened miraculously. I'm getting, I'm in like an 11th grade. I'm behind some of the guys sitting here. It's a place you could really get in touch with honesty. And an honest, could I give the visual, the kid's sitting in ninth grade class, and the Rebbe says a Rashba, and says, Rabbi Yisai's Gishmak. How many kids in the class feel that really was Gishmak? Now, the goal is, will some eventually feel it's geschmack? Yes. And many will never feel it. And the sense, if I play enough, chitzainis meris apnemius, I'll one day feel it. The interiority it. will wake up. Yeah. That's your yeah. general feeling. I'm not convinced that many people believe, me and you as we are, with the inner, who we are, as we are, that inner person can embrace and connect the Yiddishkeit. We share something, Reb David, a lot. You were describing that you use modern day techniques Techniques to show new entrance ways into Torah and Yiddishkeit. Meloi Chalaretz Kveida, God's everywhere. And finding our own connection to Hashem is in every aspect of ourselves. I don't think it's limited to one part of our human experience. And a place that people can be honest. I see so much emuna here. The amount of emuna that I see in Yeshiva of sincere, authentic service of Hashem. Nobody makes people from here. It's interesting, we have David. When guys come here initially, they're like waiting for the hero to ride in and save me. I want to introduce five guys in their story right here and what will be seen, nobody rode in and saved the day. People are allowed to exist, can initiate conversation, and in an honest way, in a very comfortable way, find the truth in a very unique, in a very authentic way, find their truth. This idea, obviously anybody talks about chenach speaks chanoich lenar al pidarkai, that we have our own unique path and journey. Do we really facilitate that? Do we really allow that? I want an environment that really believes in each person's uniqueness, each person finding their own unique connection to Hashem, their own unique connection to Torah, to mitzvahs, their own unique passion and meaning. So that's that's what Waterbury is. That's what you're seeing. I'm curious how you deal with the mainstream, and I want to actually ask you a question. I don't know a way to phrase it, but I'll, I'll phrase it. But why are you not more controversial? Meaning, you have this like very unique vision of what you think the path towards self-understanding and your relationship with Torah, with Yiddishkeit. And I know that there's an easy way. You know, I only talk about my own path, but there is an implicit critique on what the mainstream is doing. And I know others who are also widely known who they generated a lot of controversy when their words were taken to be a critique either implicitly, explicitly on what we would call the system, the yeshiva system. And for some reason, when I come here, when I hear you talk, maybe it's because you do it with such a smile, but a lot of people do it with a smile. I find it somewhat astonishing. Maybe it's the miracle of what you're doing. Maybe you have a special protection. You wear a kamiya, an amulet. That pre- why are you not more controversial? Why do you not take more friendly fire from people who are like, what are you doing to the unassailable yeshiva bacher, to the unassailable system that we have of how yeshivas have worked all these years? I love the question. I really appreciate the question. I don't know the answer, but this is my thoughts on this. The first point I want to make, we can cheaply make Waterbury. Waterbury gets plenty of kids. We get many, many kids who did okay in the system, and we get many kids who struggle in the system. We can easily, and this place would be on fire if we made an idealism surrounding ripping the system. There's plenty to say about the system and the mainstream. And by the way, it would be a war. 
then trust me, there would be fire. And you asked, there, there would be fire. And we could do it because there's much to say about any system. That's not the energy of the yeshiva. And I want to say that I think it's a cheap way when people have an idealism, you make a them. And you make a them, and whenever you have a them, that's a geschmack way of uniting people. We could sit around this table and attack them. And I promise every guy at this table could have that Rebbe that did it. And that's not the energy here. And if we had that energy, there would be arrows. That, and we have tough guys here. Yeah, it would be, be like this would be a movie. More yeah. paint. Yeah, we, by the way, it would draw more people. It would be in a way more popular. It would be more complex. And it would be very divisive. I don't think there's a them. There's no them. Whenever you speak about chinuch, you know, you'd say only love. Could you tell me the Rebbe doesn't? There's only us. There's only us. All of Klai Yisrael's us. When we're going to speak to guys here who are my heroes, they look at Rebbeim they had, and we're on our journey to that. It's us. It's all, there's no them. The school system's us. I don't even feel like the school system, I don't know if I would do it different. I don't know. You know, you need a system. You have a lot of people. I think we could add something to us. And I think that's the energy of Waterbury. That's the energy of this yeshiva. We don't view as a them. I spent thousands of my own money, thousands of dollars. I put probably over $10,000 of my own money. Yeah, not probably, more than $10,000. The first years of the yeshiva, I personally sponsored that the yeshiva went to Lakewood for a Shabbos. Why did I spend this well over 10000 I was a poor coil guy when I came here. I spent my own money to bring the yeshiva well over $10,000. I brought three different Shabbos. I brought the entire yeshiva to Lakewood. Why do we do that? What was the point? We were doing something that looks a little different than a typical Lakewood yeshiva would look. My point was from the start that we're not of them. We're not of them. I have to give credit to Ray Kaufman, who was involved in starting Waterbury, for this energy and this sense. And it's been important in the whole history of the yeshiva. We're not of them. It's all us. It's one people, and we honestly look at it that way. We could sell out and make a certain energy with the them. So when you ask the one point that I want to make, why isn't there more animosity? Why isn't this more controversial? Because we don't look at it as them, and I think it resonates by people. It's all us. And I think there are meetings, I have been told, I don't say everything that's done here is appreciated, is agreed with, that wouldn't be cool. It's, there's always different opinions. That's geschmack. But I think there are many meetings of yeshiva is where they ask, how can we do more of Waterbury? How can we bring this something there, there's something that's there that's real? I think that's an important part of what the yeshiva is. So that's one aspect that I think is very, very important. The second aspect that I think is important is to know I'm a very small person. It's not said humbly. It's said that this is not meant... It's very dangerous. You make revolutions. Listening to your podcast, I feel like a kindred spirit in this way. I'm just doing my own story. I'm not trying to create something. I'm much too small. The big scholars tell me the chamim. I come from a father who's a giant, and I'm a person struggling to find time to learn. I'm just trying to do my own story. I've been changed by the guys. I went into this. That's a story for itself. And I'm just like learning all the walls I've built and taking down walls to my own. I didn't know I was a people pleaser till a few years ago. I actually want to talk about this. I want to get to some of the stories that we have surrounded, but only on the condition that you don't leave. Because I want... Staying, I want to hear myself. Okay. I want to start with your story because I assume your plan A was you... Are you the oldest son? I'm the second oldest the son. The second oldest son. I don't, but you're the son of Rabbi Kalish. You know, I'm, I'm doing hand motions. You know, you grew up with <laughs> son of blank as your last name. And you were never introduced as just your first name. You and then maybe you walked away, took five steps, and then you heard the whisper, that's Rabbi Kalish's son. You know, I yeah. probably grew up hearing that. I grew up, I still hear that. And I, it's a point of pride for me now. But I'm curious, you always talk about how you changed or you realized, you, you know, you, you were a people pleaser. and you. Is there a point that you can place in your own story? I mean, I look, there's this video that went viral of you showing up at an airport and you being danced by students. And I saw that. I got emotional. I got emotional. We didn't even know each other then. We, we literally did not know each other. You give me permission to say that there's a kindredness. I think 
if somebody saw me from a distance, like Beshevkin, like in your dreams, is there a kid? I, I really do feel it. I really do in, in, in the way I try to go about things. And you showed me a possibility that what I'm trying to accomplish can be done, can be done with a sweetness, with a not everything that you say. But I'm curious for you, was there a moment that you feel like you arrived or you felt like, oh, now I see what I'm trying to accomplish? Where do you place in your own mind? You were on a trajectory to be, I don't know, Rebbe Kaler's son. He'll also, I don't know, finish all of Talmud Bavli every year, as your father is famous for. He'll also become a, you know, maybe a Rebbe in Yeshiva Farakaway or whatever that path was. And now you're doing something very different, which is scary. When did you feel like what I'm doing that's different, which is scary, is what I should be doing? Yeah, it's a great question. The answer is long, and I'd love to share the whole story. One point, I have personal reasons that I don't share the whole story yet. I want to share the whole story. What I want to say relevant to this question is I've had people ask me, you're the voice on feeling, Kalish. You're the voice on emotion. People that know me to my core, you're a smiley guy. Are you in touch with your emotions? You've become a voice of something to the a degree that you're not even great at. And when you talk about, you know, the scene at the airport, I look at it that it's not mine. And I look at it that it belongs to the guys. When we're sitting here now, we're sitting with a group of guys. I've stolen what's theirs. And I've learned from guys something and I'm learning. I'm very in middle learning something that I see in today's generation that's moving me. And how this will happen, I get right, Catherine asked me to come to Waterbury and I was involved. I brought older, very serious guys to Waterbury. One is a principal today. One is a Shas Yid, who started a famous therapist, Divu Talmid Chachamim, very strong guys, and I was going to learn with them. And Ray Kaufman brought 20 younger guys who were more energetic and had a certain vision. Along the way, I got involved, and a lot happened along the way, Bashkach Hashem. Along the way of learning with guys who are figuring out life, I started seeing things, and I'm still, this is a continuous journey of people that are feeling, experiencing, and getting close to Hashem in ways that I think is life-changing. That I think somebody could pray to God in this authentic, sincere way that's life-changing. I was woken up four in the morning by a dorm counselor on this campus in the corner. They knocked on the door of the hotel where I'm trying to get you to come for a Shabbos, Rev. David. You won't be woken up. They won't mix <laughs> doors. And they knocked four in the morning. Wake up. We need you. We need you. They were holding down a bacher, the strongest dorm counselor, Nachum Wolf. So I promise you that Nachum Wolf had blood on his shirt. I promise. He had blood on his undershirt. He was in the middle of the night. He was holding down a bacher. I don't think it was his own blood. I hope, I don't know if it was the Bachar or the guy he punched, but they had blood on his shirt and they woke me up. They couldn't manage this guy. And I walked with him from four to seven Shabbos morning. We were talking, we were walking around the campus. He showed me that he has a notebook of letters to God that he's written this Bachar. He's 16 years old. He has letters to Hashem that he's written. I didn't write any letters to Hashem at 16. I knew Masech was getting very well, but this guy wrote letters to Hashem. He was in a very serious relationship to Hashem. I ended up, we made a deal at seven in the morning. We said we both need some sleep, and we made a deal that he'll work on making me from, and I'm gonna work on helping him get healthy. That was the deal we made seven in the morning. I started finding there's emuna and honesty and connection that runs deep people that are getting in there and figuring out and resolving. And again, this doesn't need a kid who's struggling in that way, though he's a beautiful person. Many of our youth, in figuring out their own emotions, their own situations, that kid who wouldn't dive in, and when you hand them a cedar and you look at him, what's his problem? Why can't it be like us? We just plowed through. What's this new generation? I don't get them with Shabbos. Just like, go, come on. Today's generation's protesting that we crave Shabbos. They don't just want to keep Shabbos today. We want to be crazy. Now, you got to keep it on the path to craving it. But it's a generation that's saying we crave Shabbos. That's what I'm seeing. It's when you ask, is there one moment? There are definitely moments that happened. We went through a big tsar in yeshiva. We lost two students that... Um, that mean a lot to me, that meant a lot to me, and that caused a lot of thinking. I think the trajectory of yeshiva changed. Eli and Dani, when if they're on the way to yeshiva, I look at that, that whole period, a lot changed. Really, before that, I was building a yeshiva. From that time, I, didn't, I don't care, I'm not building a yeshiva. It became much more about people, about a mission. It stopped being about an institution to me, personally. The brochure. That's an institution. 
Yeah. Things changed a lot then. That's a story. That's a history of the yeshiva that was definitely life-changing. I do point a lot. I don't want to make it overly dramatic because there are much more subtle and minor things. When a kid told me, when I handed him a siddur, don't ever do that again and cried, those are moments, and I have many moments like that with kids. Kids have expressed, I would be positive, and a kid would tell me his sad story, and I'd cheer him up. Some guys liked it, and so I said, you're not feeling what I'm saying. And then I started saying, he's right. Right. I'm cheering him up, but I'm not in pain. I'm not feeling his pain. I'm not feeling what he's feeling. I'm not like listening to what he's saying. I'm not experiencing what he's experiencing. And when you experience it, we're so afraid of that. And we build walls not to actually places we can get to of closeness to Hashem and all different places we can get to. And that's really the continuous journey. I don't want to make it like it happened. It's happening. There have definitely been moments, things happen that are leading me this way, but that's what I see. I want to kind of open it up now because so much of the kinship that I feel, aside from you are much more successful than I am at avoiding controversy and difficulty. I gotta get better yeah. at it than that. But what underlies is is the story of the humanity of our Yiddishkeit, of our religious commitments. And you brought, like, I mean, it's so moving that it's so people-centric. Usually you go to a yeshiva and you go to an organization. I don't want to make it... I'm involved in organizational life too. When somebody comes to visit, you bring out the brochure children. The children who are going to be right in front of the brochure they're dressed a certain way and they're you know and like when I look around and I'm not saying God forbid that none of all of you should be are beautiful enough to be on the cover of any brochure but it doesn't feel like you picked the cleanest cut like oh you, you, let me show you our prize pristine you know just got a haircut earlier in the morning you know I mean, change, change your shirt change your shirt you know you don't have any of that I want to hear why I want to open it up tell me can we listen to a story can I interact on, yeah. on a level of story yeah this is new this yeah. is different <laughs> yeah let's get right to it I spoke a long time already and really the guy should speak first they deserve I'm a student here and, and trying to grow myself this point that you're describing who you show how you show it. I'll tell you an interesting story that we have a guy who graduated. He came to the yeshiva with a black yarmulke and he was the, like, the good kid, nice kid, and he left here looking not clean. He has a relative who's rabbinic. When I see him at weddings, he goes, no, no, my cousin, and he makes a motion with his hands, like, Elish, hey, you blew this one. <laughs> now, there's nothing I could say. If his cousin didn't feel close enough to tell him his story, I'm not going to. And I just shrug. What? This doesn't, it's a question that doesn't have an answer. What he doesn't know, his cousin, when he came here, it's a nace, he's alive by the age of 20. He went through severe trauma. I can't, I'm not right now going to share his story, but he went through tremendous amounts. When he came, he might have looked from, he wasn't from. He left here a beautiful person. Today he's older, well on his way to building a good, beautiful from home. People's stories are continuous when they're in touch, when they feel, when they experience, and it can't look pretty for people. In the room who I brought and who's here with us are from the most honest, successful, I specifically, guys who grew together with family members. That was important to me. I feel like when people are honest to their story, it's much more impactful, the growth. We all know the term like a flip out. Somebody, there's a way of growing like Chitzonis Merisapanemis. I don't find it inspiring to people around you. You just made it and you fight through. I don't think the sister comes along. I brought guys in this room whose whole families are changing and change because of them. I think when it's honest, it's catchy and it draws others with them. That's what I see. If your sister's not from her because of your growth, you might have just like, and there's what to be said about you're just powering through Power such through. a thing. I don't think it's moving to siblings. I don't think it's moving to your environment. I think when it's deep and real and authentic and powerful, and I shouldn't even call the other thing not real because everybody's but journey to real is no monopoly, but when it's more like this, I specifically brought guys what I want to show what's moving to me is people that have worked out a lot, gotten in touch with a lot. I don't know here if this is, you know, how much each guy, that's each guy's. I don't speak for the guys. I don't own their stories for sure. I'm just moved by it. You'll decide with them. They'll yeah. decide how much they want to share, but I do want to introduce four specific guys that are here that are, five, five that are here. There's a number of people, this is not being video, yeah. there are a number that are here. I didn't ask for shots from everybody here. There's five specific friends, I'll call them by first name, who are all growing people who have moved me in my life and moved the people around them. There's a Maymay, a Maish, Chaim, an Avi, and a Mo. 
five friends that I'd love you to speak to and I'd love to listen in to be a fly on the wall as you have a conversation with them. So maybe we could begin with an opening question of how would you describe the trajectory of your story when you first arrived here? Meaning, where do you think you were headed or what was the friction that brought you to this yeshiva? When you came here, you were a year out of your bar mitzvah. I assume, right? Two years, four, one and a half. Yeah. At that point in your life, and I'm curious, I'm going to ask for just a show of hands. Anybody here remember the first time that they missed putting on tefillin? No. Don't remember. Nope. You, you don't remember? Do you think that you had missed a day by the time you had arrived here? Oh, for sure. And the home that you came from, can you describe like where it was situated? I don't need a place. I don't need a last name. Was it more like a more yeshivish? How would you describe the religious sensibility of the home that you each emerge from? I would describe it as uh, very religious. Very religious. Yeah, ultra orthodox. Ultra orthodox. How would you describe it? Also very religious. Not like so yeshivish, but like very religious. Serious. Like strict. Yeah. When you think about the strictness of the Yiddish kite that you were raised with, what imagery comes to your mind? Like for me, when I think strict and Yiddish kite, I think of my father's expectations to sit next to him during Yomim Norayim. And this is not, God forbid, my father, people who've been listening to the podcast long enough No, I've said it many times. And if I took one of those scales and I put my parents on one end, they would outweigh every teacher that I've had from every institution cumulatively by a wide margin. But I remember, as any parent does, I already blew it. You know, I feel like I already blew it with my, my son seven. I already feel like, ah, I messed up. But the mess up when I think strict in my religious life and what I needed to heal in a lot of ways was sitting in shul, specifically on Yom Narayim. That's when my father really wanted to be next to him. And the way he would point... Even the pointing, I felt it had a harshness to it. And when I would like squirm and scramble, he would sometimes like really like get me back to the chair and pull me in. The suffocation that I felt probably at, at your age for sure before was very davening centric. I'm curious the imagery that you think of when you think strict, suffocating, what first comes to mind in your religious upbringing? I don't think it was necessarily about religion. But I think it was more just like not to embarrass them or just to like... How would you embarrass your parents? I don't know, by just like getting in trouble in school or not dressing a certain way on Shabbos, going out like... Shabbos dress. Were there strict rules? Were you, did you change on Shabbos? Yeah, you'd want to change. Like you're going to play some sports with your friends and like be like, yeah, you don't want people to look at you like that. But it might not have been... For you, it might have been for them. It was know? a big no-no, you should know. I one time, you know, I'm going to mention the name because he's the current president of the OU where uh, I am employed, uh, Mitch Ader. I one time went to his house for Shabbos, not because I wanted to hang out with Mitch Ader, but his son Zev was in my class. Zev is now, you know, he learned in Taurus Moshe. He's a really unbelievable person. I went to Zev's house that Shabbos in eighth grade because Motsi Shabbos, Saturday night, we were going to a Blink-180 concert. I don't know if you still remember what Blink-182 was. I have secretly a hope that one of their famous songs, that I can't even mention the name of the song, but I happen to think Waterbury should do a slow acoustic cover of it. It begins with a D and ends with an amet, so I can't really even say the name of the song, but it would be beautiful as a Waterbury slow acoustic cover. But I remember on that Mosi Shabbos, we came down and we were dressed for the concert already for Havdullah, and Mitch Ader really gave it to us. He said, well, you're changing before Havdalah? Like, the rule of wearing Shabbos clothes went up into Havdalah time. So I'm curious for any of you, A, number one, we just heard Moshe and Chaim. I'm curious, would you describe the religious universe that you grew up in similarly? I would say very similar, but in their own way. I'm wondering if each of you could answer the question. I really want the imagery of close your eyes when you think strict suffocating when you feel those words I know what I feel when I feel the constriction of religious expectations take hold it's not hard for me to access it I'm curious for you if there are specific incidents that come to mind I'm Avi hey Av the example that you gave was something I could very much relate to not just on Yom and Arim, but something that you guys were talking about earlier about just pushing pushing through and just like kind of just just being there just the, grind, on, yeah, the grind the grind going and that's something i definitely felt a lot in shul in shul like as a kid just being not really knowing what i was doing there or why i was there but more like you got to be here so you have to sit in your chair like what Chaim said i don't think it was about the religion i think it was the way it was given over
the pressure, the certain expectations that were set. Give me an expectation you remember that you felt was either out of reach or unreasonable. Yeah, needing to go to school in the morning, even when I was tired, to go to shockers. And it was just like, I can't get out of bed. Like, what do you like, want from I'm me? I'm tired. I want to sleep, but I had to go to school. Mornings for you were like a place yeah, where it just felt unreasonable. I okay. I would say also with Beggett Chavez, it was a big deal. Like, when I wanted to, like, start taking off the tie, it was like, oh, come on, it's Shabbos, like... Even tie? So yeah. you came from a fairly formal home? Yeah, I would say that, yeah. Okay. Do you feel like the path of coming to Waterbury was plan A or plan B in your parents' mind? Not even plan a plan. A? Like, yeah. not even on the yeah, table. I don't think it was a plan. It was just like, I'm going there, I, I need to, like, do my own thing, and, like, I just gotta, like, get out. What was know. plan A? What do you think you grew up thinking plan A mainstream. was? Mainstream. Main, what, what is the mainstream? What, no, what was you, plan A? You go to Yeshiva, you learn Gemara, you go to Israel, you know, you do the basic stuff. Get married, have kids. Nah, just the, the regular, this is the trajectory. Just like Jewish, check, uh, check, check. Life. Like, yeah. Like you scroll down before you go to a website, and you scroll down. And you said read terms of agreement next, and like, when was the first conversation that you had with a parent and said, "Plan A is not working for me." I remember a conversation I had with my with my father. Like I just like I sat him down and I was like, "I'm just really not happy where I'm at." And uh, it's like something has to change. Obviously, a much longer conversation, but... How old are you? You're in eighth grade? No, this was uh, maybe the beginning of 10th grade. And what sparked the conversation where you talk to a father and say, this trajectory is not working for me? Just the way I was feeling in my everyday lifestyle just was not working for me. Like constantly going to school and going through the motions without actually feeling it. What was the initial reaction? No, like this is staying the same. The initial reaction was staying the same. I'm curious for anybody else, that conversation, that's a tough conversation. That could be the hardest conversation. Plan A, and everybody, everybody has a plan A. Some of us have B, C, go all the way to Z, and then you have to start, you know, like A1, A2. But I'm curious, remembering and coming back to that initial conversation, plan A is not working out the way we thought it was. Yeah, I was in ninth grade. And like you said, like what sparked it actually, my brother sparked it, my older brother, very cool. As, as we said, we're talking about my relationship with my brother. I had, even back then, I had a regular relationship with my brother. Obviously, it went on to new levels as the years go on. Your older brother? Yeah, my older brother. Was he on the what I would call the plan A trajectory? I don't think so. He was also in Waterbury, happens to be. Okay. Yeah, so. So uh, the fact that he was in Waterbury, I'm just curious. Definitely changed a lot. That's why I was going to say Did the that other make your parents different. more nervous or less nervous? Less. Less. Okay, so you had a brother who was there, but you were not on the going to Waterbury path at the time. Um, well, you could say I sort of was. They okay. just didn't, no one really spoke about Waterbury. Like, I was just, you know, in a couple of yeshivas. It didn't work out. Why didn't it work out? It didn't work out because they wanted me to be a part of the yeshiva system, in which I was already, like... You're talking too big for me, the, the yeshiva system. I was in a yeshiva called... Okay. In which they understandably want me to start diving in the morning and they want me to go to Gemara Shir and both of those, I had no idea why I would do it. And I feel like this is the point in my life where I could say like, oh yeah, if I don't know why I'm doing this, then I'm going to stop doing it. And that didn't work out for obviously the... For the fact that to be in yeshiva, you have to want to be in yeshiva. So, or at least someone has to force you to be there. You almost like understood like... The, yeah, no, yeah, it was a mutual thing. Like, yeah. I don't want to be here. You don't want someone that doesn't want to be here because I yeah. wrecks the yeshiva. So we sort of parted ways and I uh, did that with a different yeshiva as well because like I said, I didn't want to be in the yeshiva. And my parents were very good in this aspect that they understood that that wasn't the right place for me and they helped me come to the place that was right for me. And that, and that was very that was very beneficial for me. Did that future. take a conversation with your parents? Yes. Yeah. Why? Why would they resist that? Well, they didn't resist it. They didn't resist it at all? Very little. What did they say? So what was the thrust of the conversation? Water Ray does not usually take ninth graders. Back then, that was uh, not a big thing. Oh, so yeah. you needed like a special, you were like special ops. You needed like the yeah, special. Yeah, we, were, we really broke Special ops for Waterbury. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So my brother, but like I said, my brother was here, so he spoke to Rabbi Kalish and I'm just curious if Rabbi Kales could jump in. Why didn't Waterbury take ninth graders? Was that because it was like the yeshiva of last resort that like nobody wants to start in Waterbury? Like, was that really the reason? Like, no. No, it, it does. It, it has that vibe. Yeah, of like, gives, we're not it, even starting with the ninth grade. Like, this is only after ninth grade doesn't work out. Yeah. Then you could come here. It's funny. It does give a, a look to that. But the reason there's no ninth grade is the whole yeshiva is about honest conversation, much like you're having now. And it's an open, honest conversation. I tend to think that youngsters are not ready for that yet. I'm not convinced that a yeshiva like this should be for ninth graders. 
because as a guy gets older, he's more ready to have the honest conversation. I have met many a 10th grader that I tell to wait for 11th grade because if a kid's not ready, if a guy's not ready for that honest conversation, then I don't think there's a good place for him. Then he should be in a school uh -huh. that just tells you what to do. At an age and a place that a guy wants to start talking. When we're little, a lot of our chinuch is getting our kids just in the habit, regilus. Yeah. At a certain age, the Meshavruah says at Bar Mitzvah, maybe today we're a drip slower, he says chinuch changes from chinuch to teichacha. There's much more of a dialogue. And Waterbury is about that dialogue, and I think it takes place around the ages of 15, 16, 17. So that's why there's no ninth grade here. I'm curious, I want to hear from the others about that initial conversation with a parent about plan A is not going the way we thought it was going to go. Just to give you some background, I grew up in a very like strict, disciplined home. So having a conversation like that was not even like a thought in my head. Now my parents are extremely understanding and I'm able to have honest conversation where I feel comfortable that they listen and they understand where I'm at in life, which is amazing. But let's rewind to when that was challenging. Yeah, yeah so growing up, I would never think about having conversations with them like that, of that sort, where Why I would not? tell them, because it was just very strict home. Like, What were the rules? I mean, you had mentioned a couple rules before. Where did the strictness in your home come out? You had a dress code in your house? Like, what, When you say, I grew up in a strict home what does that mean you had to do what you were told and that's just the way it was uh-huh and when do you remember either a parent approaching you or you approaching a parent do you remember which way it was to have a conversation like this there was never a conversation like that because it was just not something that I even thought of so how did you how did I end up here I was in in five towns and Yaakov Richland who is someone who learns here right now was a Waterbury guy and he sent me Rabbi Kalish's number and I called Rabbi Kalish and asked for an interview. You called directly to Rabbi yes. Kalish? Did your parents know that you were doing that? My parents knew. Okay. They were not willing to make the call, but they said if I make the call, they will go to the interview. I actually like that, meaning they placed the agency yeah. in your hands. If you yeah. really want to do this, yeah. okay. Yeah, it just wasn't working in my old school. So I called Rabbi Kalish and I went to his house on a Monday Shabbos. We drove two hours and we sat down for an interview. And after it was decided that I would come to Waterbury. We're missing one. Do you remember having an initial conversation about coming? Yeah, I think it was more like a couple of conversations over a couple of weeks. I was in a yeshiva that wasn't even my first option. The yeshiva that was my first option ended up rescinding their application for me or my application for them. So I was in a yeshiva that was technically my second option already, my plan B. And it wasn't like I was getting in trouble or anything like that. I just wasn't doing anything. I was not going anywhere. And over a couple of weeks, my parents were just talking to me. They were saying, like, what do you want to do? They gave me some options, and to their credit, they really tried to help me. And But whenever I brought up Waterbury, it was, it was a hard no. It wasn't a conversation like what you're thinking of. It's not, it wasn't even something close to that. It was, it was just, that's not even an option. There's drugs there. Like, I can't. You they shut it there. down. Yeah. So what eventually prevailed? I think it just got to a point where they kind of, they realized that there was no other option. For me and but for them in their minds this was a really a place of last resort they thought that this was like a yeah do they still look at it that way oh no for sure not i'm curious when did you feel was there a moment or a conversation that you felt that you had a new way of approaching yiddishkeit itself what exactly was a turning point not an arrival but a change in trajectory in you know what was otherwise suffocating and felt very restricting and i don't mean in a strict sense there were a lot of rules but restrictive of your sense of self when did you feel like there was a turn that yiddishkeit is something sustainable for me now? I would say it's not something that I could pinpoint at one point in time. Uh, I've been here for four years since I was in ninth grade and it's all about slow growth. It's a really long process. It's not just something that one day I woke up and I decided to put on tefillin. It's not just one day that I woke up and decided to try my best to keep all the mitzvos. There are some points, some milestones for me that that I could say. What's a milestone that jumps out at you? I think I was in 10th grade I was in camp for the summer. I was in a traveling camp for the summer, and I put on tefillin for the first time in a while. I just had a feeling to bring it. It was on the packing list, and I just decided to bring it. And that was even a choice at the time. Like, maybe you won't bring your tefillin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't consistently putting on back then, and I just decided to bring it, and 
yeah, I've been uh, doing my best to put it on ever since. I'm curious for all of you, and I don't know, Rabbi Kells, you can, of course, pull the plug out at any point. There are two things that I'm curious. Does anybody here still struggle with putting on tefillin daily? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Meaning, and you miss days. Yeah. 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 I'm curious of one other question that I want to drill a little bit deeper because I look at a lot of these, your relationship to tefillin. There are a few, a handful of misses that I look at. Sometimes they're like the canary in the coal mine of how is one's relationship with their inner self, with their relationship with the endurance component of Yiddish. And I feel like tefillin sometimes, it could feel very suffocating and restricting. You have memories of like putting them on half asleep. And even I, it could be a struggle. I'm curious, especially in this yeshiva, and I'm scared if it's okay to ask this, relationship with Shabbos observance. I know a lot of people struggle with Shabbos. Is Shabbos a struggle here? I think Shabbos is always a struggle. I don't think it's always easy or ever. Not actually, it's easy some days, some Shabbos. But I want to mention that I think that there's the endurance part of the Shabbos, which I think of the whole religion. I think it's obviously a big deal. It's, you know, following all the commandments. I want to say that when you have the religion without the relationship, that's where the problems occur. And I think that sometimes what I had as a kid, which a lot of kids have, is they have the religion. They're taught the, the religion. endurance. Like, here's the track. The only the endurance. They're not Break taught. Break the four minute mile. Amazing. Yeah, they're not taught that there's a Hashem watching over you every day. There's someone that you can always talk to. There's someone that's to make sure you're okay and there's someone you could talk to that could always help you and I think once you're taught that the endurance is a very different mindset it's not like I have to this it's like I can do this and Shabbos is still hard because we're not just a soul we're not someone that only wants to connect with Hashem we're obviously brought here to also have the part of us that wants to connect to the short term pleasures and the, everything else that drags at us in this world which is the beauty of it that we could overcome those stuff but besides that I want to say that once you know what you're doing once you know God and you know what ultimately is best for you it's not like uh, as much as it is a struggle you know which is which is awesome it's also something that you you choose the struggle once it's your struggle that you chose it's it's a different fire. It's like hard, but it's it's like when you choose to work out, you know? Not like when you have to sit in class. It's like when you choose to work out, it's a struggle, but you, you're, you're happy with the struggle. You're proud of the struggle. And you don't always work out every day, but you always have your eyes on the working out. You know what I mean? As, as opposed to when you're in eighth grade or whatever grade you're in, you're forced to go sit in Gemara Shir or I shouldn't say Gemara Shir, any Shir, or be anywhere where you didn't choose to be and it was chosen for you to be, where you only have to do the endurance and you don't have that, that your own connection to it. I have a question, and again, I'm conscious of the fact that Rev Kalish is sitting here, but I want to ask about look, all of you came from families, it sounds like, that care deeply about your religious commitment, involvement. And my guess is your parents, they must have tried other things. There must have been teachers and rabbeim in your own yeshiva who also put their hand on your shoulder and said that you're great and you're wonderful and really tried to be, that's my guess. And you could correct me if I'm wrong and I have no problem with that. My question is, what do you see being done differently here? And I don't want to make it specifically about Rav Kalish, but I do want something specific about Rav Kalish, and that is, I don't know, you come in here, you're in 10th grade, why isn't there more cynicism about him? Why aren't people cynical about, like, this guy over here, like, solve all of the Jewish people's problems, put a hand on your shoulder, tell you a good A- minus to A+, plus Vart on the Parsha, you know, depending on the day and how much energy he has. But, like, why isn't there more, like, eye-rolling about, like, the Waterbury path? There's, like, a real sincerity here. How do you capture that, and how did you not fall into the trap? You were high school kids, half burnt out, burnt about everything else that people threw at you. So, like, why weren't you burnt out and cynical about this? I feel like, because you're really just, a, you're accepted here. I don't know, you come in, like, at first you feel... I'm missing something. No, I'm, you, missing... I'm, gonna, I'm gonna explain. Like, I, you see the Rav, like, one of the first times you're coming on campus, and you're like, you're like, okay, like, you see he gives everyone a hug, but you still, like, feel like... You're like, okay, it's a little awkward. Like, you, you're not wearing a yarmulke. You're like, okay, I don't know. I, I don't feel so comfortable. And you go to him, and it's it's not just like a hug. It's like a real feeling. Like, you're really... He's not looking at that. It has nothing to do with what you're wearing, like, or how you look. He just loves you for who you are. And you didn't feel that. You, again, you came here in what grade? Ninth or 10th? No, I did. I, that's what I felt when I came here. I'm saying until you came here. What grade yeah. did you come here in? In 10th grade. I've been here for three years. And you didn't feel that in your previous mm. educational experience? Not at all. I'm saying you could, you could have someone tap you on the shoulder. There's very nice, but like if it's not from a real place, there's nothing there. It's not real. I'm curious if anybody here has a moment where they felt the sincerity of the relationship. And I'm not talking about your relationship with Hashem, but like he really cares. Because I struggle with that. I don't know. He gave a story about a, a walk at four o'clock in the morning. I'm curious how every educator in their mind, I believe in my heart of hearts, loves and cares about their. But there's something different that I see happening here. And I'm wondering 
interesting why more are not falling into the trap of cynicism same old okay it's not the first person who i saw put their arm over my shoulder you know what i mean like i feel like a lot of them have like an end goal they're just like okay like i'm gonna do it and then they just they see you and they want you to become something over here that's not what it is it's pure just like okay like i actually like like this guy and like he could do something it's not like okay i'm gonna like i'm gonna support him and whatever and he's gonna turn it into god or this that it's not what it is it doesn't have to do with what they're going to be they could not be religious whatever it's as long as they're happy with themselves and they actually they're true to themselves i want to talk a little bit about those boundaries i'm curious is there anything that any of you would be embarrassed being seen doing by rev kalish now or then now now, are there things that like because you prize the sincerity of the relationship that because of that you try to kind of like in a holy way in a sincere way I'm saying that you don't want him seeing you and being involved in not okay things. Even if there were things like that, his thoughts on you would never, wouldn't get changed by that. It's a nice amount of vaping here. I'll be honest, because you, you're like substance free. I, I grew up, I'm addicted to everything on planet Earth, like literally, like I, I and I've been through the, been through the ring here. We don't, we don't, we don't have to get into details. We don't have to get into, into the, into the specifics. And I'm curious for you. Did you have to work on not seeing that, on not noticing who's vaping, who's not vaping, who's wearing a yarmulke, who's not wearing a yarmulke? I'll give you something very blatant. In YU, the number one thing that like, you know, people, uh, I saw a kid without a yarmulke in YU and they scream and they shout and I'm thinking in the back of my head, A, number one, there are people who come to my class, they don't wear a yarmulke. I, I don't want my whole relationship with them to be the yarmulke police. And I'm curious for you, did you have to train yourself to not see? Is that natural for you? Or you do notice and you care a little bit? Like, I, I wanna hear a little bit of relationship with boundaries. Everybody just took a hit as you're thinking about the answer to the question. Well, while he's thinking, can I quickly say something? Yeah, of course. Please. Sweet, sweet. Please, um, I please. want to mention on this previous thing about why people don't always fall into the trap of cynicism here, why they're not you know, rejecting all the yeah. amazing things that uh, Yeshiva has to offer. I want to mention that they don't look at you and say, like, how can we put you to run on a sitter? Or, sorry, but on film, like, like similar to what he was saying, that they look at you and see, like, why is this person not connected to Hashem right now? Like, like there's, a, there's a lack of connection here. Why is that? And they'll work on, they'll work on your own healthiness in that aspect too, and how to relate to how to, they'll work on. Let's say have a relationship with your friend before your relationship with God, and I think that's a, a necessary thing. Before what do you mean by that? Work on your relationship with a friend. If how you can't, would you if work you're not on in the right place to have, a, to have a healthy relationship with your friend? You're not necessarily in the right place to have a healthy connection with with Hashem. And they notice that before they try to put on to fill it on you. And they how, notice that. Bef- how have your friendships changed since you came here? Well, I would say that as a kid, I think a lot of relationships aren't necessarily as deep as when they are. When you start getting 14, 15, 16, you start maturing and start being aware of impact you have on others and what and when things could hurt you. I think as a kid, we're we're a little bit as much. You could say we're also a lot more. We're a lot more vulnerable. Like if someone tells me as a kid, I'll start crying. Now I could I could parry deep down, you know, pretend like it didn't hurt me. So I would say I didn't have that many deep relationships as a kid, as opposed mm-hmm. to now where you tend to have a lot more. I love that. No, there's so much connections. Well, you mm-hmm. were just said and what Rav Kaler said earlier about your religious life uplifting the entire family life, that your friendships, that the interpersonal relationships being right. intertwined, not just like you have to do both sides of the column, but each side of the column is informing and enhancing and amplifying and really at the heart of interpersonal personal and divine relationships I find very moving but I want to come back to the boundaries question and that's both a personal question I'm not asking the yeshiva policy the handbook I'm saying you as an educator I want to talk about this question with boundaries and it's an important question boundaries but I want to back up for a second we'll watch a kid and certainly Chil Shabbos is Hummer in Kla Yisrael very very serious. Hummer, very yes. serious and nobody lessens it somebody will watch their kid that's a great job is painful Can I ask a question on the parent in an honest, brutal way? How deep is your own connection to Shabbos? Real, real. You're alone in the world. Are you fired up? Shabbos is not just a well, it's a law. The Shabbos, Kodesh, Ka'ech Saif Nayim Shabbos. In an honest question, any parent has to ask. They look at their child, and their child, this is a nightmare. They're being Mechalel Shabbos. How real is your own connection to Shabbos? Is it fire? Is it deep? Is it pash? I'm not saying 24-7. And I'm not saying that even if you don't have it, shucks, we still got to keep. But we're shooting. Hashem spoke to us at Sinai. We're shooting for something. When I see a guy in yeshiva, a guy struggling with Shabbos, how deep Dan Kalish, my Shabbos, 
You're talking to five guys. You ask, and it's a good question, where are you up to in the Shabbos observance? Do you know you're looking at five guys? They care about God. And Shabbos is like meaningful. I watch, I sit near Avi, we sit near each other. It happens to be, for most of you, not, you four sit near me by Zmiris. They say, when are we singing Zmiris? Avi asks weekly. He's a normal, cool guy. Good looking, regular guy. The guy wants Zmira Shabbos. It's not a joke. It's not, why haven't we sung yet? One of my sons have an attachment to Shabbos. They're doing something on Shabbos. You're looking at five guys who have Shabbos Kodesh. Then we could discuss, of course, the discipline. And many times we don't feel all human. What's unique here, they're guys. It's a rare place. They're guys who have Shabbos. I want to ask on our system, and it's all us. There's no you. How many of our youth have Shabbos? I'm not talking about that they listen to our rules. How many of our youth go to any 12th grade? And I ask principals and kids, how many of our youth? My dream for my kids, if they'd be the only person on earth, Avi here, if he'd be the only person would sing a songs on Shabbos. If he'd be alone, I promise you, they have Shabbos. We have to ask ourselves, we're like worried, hey, he's misbehaving. Hey, he's not putting, how many have tefillin? How many people, 50, their tefillin matters? I put on tefillin, how can I look, you ask, you wonder, you look at kids, a kid's not putting on tefillin, boundaries. I just first asked, what's my connection to tefillin? Tefillin because of the guys, to watch the guys here put on their tefillin, it's worth it, people should travel hours to come to yeshiva, stand in the base medrash and watch people come and put on their phylacteries with pride, with connection, with relationship. Of course, we need the discipline to do when we don't feel it, but there's a force called tefillin. There's a beauty called Shabbos Kaidish. Now, of course, and when we look at our kid and we look at a kid in our family, hey, he's breaking our rule. We have to ask ourselves, do I have something special called Shabbos Kaidish? At a certain age, you're meeting five people and the school, well-meaning, was saying, hey, you're not doing this behavior. Are we giving over Shabbos, tefillin, tefillah, prayer? We can get a whole classroom, we can get a whole school to all be in shul. Is anybody praying to God? You have given lectures about prayer. Prayer is very deep and meaningful and everybody has to ask, are we imparting prayer that people are talking to God, their God, in a personal relationship? Prayer, as you're explaining in your podcast, is complex. These are five guys who are having Shabbos and tefillin and prayer. Hashem is very real in their lives. They have an honest relationship and of course are working as loyal servants of God to have all the discipline that a loyal servant should have. But I want to push back in a holy way, not even push back, but continue the dialogue and come back to the boundary question. There is a psychologist, uh, Donald Winnicott, who talks about like all love or nothing but love and students want to test the unconditional love and boundaries help test that. They help know that like we have real boundaries. I'm going to love you, but I'm going to discipline you. I'm curious what the role if any, of boundaries and discipline are in your relationship to your Talmudim? Have you ever thrown out a Talmud and why? And what do you do beyond talking about the beauty of the journey? I'm curious, like I'm like phrasing this in a weird way, but I'm almost projecting my own struggles of like 1840. Like, why are you not in more trouble for this? Like, what? what <laughs> Remind me, Shalom. Like, like, boundaries are real in any relationship. There are boundaries and there are rules and there's normalcy. What's going to be the boundary if all of us have a real relationship. And if a guy is breaking a boundary and doing something he shouldn't be doing, so in any healthy relationship with your own children, Reb David, all of us with our own kids will call out our child and say, excuse, what is that? So we have definite things in our relationship. If a guy's doing something to hurt himself, he's doing something inappropriate, but of course there are boundaries. The problems become when we have somebody not in any relationship, there's no Yiddishkeit, and we've made some boundary that he has no shaykh is to. It seems is arbitrary. That it's, and the kid's breaking things we call boundaries. We're just, the vert here is to be in touch with each person. All of us have a unique and personal relationship. And in that relationship, if somebody, any one of us, you asked Mo about, are you embarrassed by things if you would do something? But of course, that would be embarrassing to do something inappropriate for where I'm up to. They all have, and I have my own journey where I'm up to. And as friends, they call 
call each other out. They have room meetings where they hold each other responsible for things. And better than do I call them out. Is they that call true? Each- yeah, very true. That's very beautiful. There was just an article in the New York Times where there's a town, I think it's Brownsville, there's a certain town where the police allow the residents of the town to take over all 911 responses for like two days at a time. And they said crime has dropped, meaning all low crime citizens are able to respond. Instead of calling the police department, they said the city that we're going to take over 911. So the front cover of the New York Times uh, this week, we're going to be in charge. I'm curious, what exactly, what are the areas where the room has that mutual responsibility? A therapist taught me about this. It's like a three-step process to do with like, for us, it works out just for like a room or a community of people. And the first step is taking accountability for something you personally want to take on yourself to work on. It could be whatever. It could be I'm leaving the room messy and my new behavior will be I'm going to make my bed in the morning. Second step is you call out another person in a respectful way and you're not expecting them to change. You say, this is just how I feel about this. And they have the opportunity to respond. Like you say a feeling along with what they did and then they respond with they hear that you feel that feeling and with that they feel whatever they're feeling about what you said. It could be really apologetic and it could be absolutely no remorse. That's like mm-hmm. just any any feeling that you want. And then the third step is just is an acknowledgement. Like I, I see how great you're doing with this. Like thank you for leaving the room keeping the room clean. Like thank you for this. Like Thank you for whatever, you know, so. I really, really love that you do that. I want to ask one last question from this chevra that we have over here. You know, so much of what we emphasize on 1840 is the familial unit and how religiosity, when it's filtered through religion, can sometimes be like the sweetest thing, the most uplifted thing in the world, and it could sometimes be like the most painful thing in the world. Like I know for myself, my parents used to always bother me, say, how come you don't tell us anything? And I say, I don't tell you anything, not because I don't love you, but because I love you so much that if I see you twitch in your left eye when I tell you what's going on in my life, I'm going to take it as like disapproval and I'm going to fall apart. It's because I hold you in such high esteem that it's so dangerous to give you information. Every accomplishment or change in my life that I hand you can feel like almost like a loaded gun I'm handing you because if you if you look a little bit like, okay, uh, that's good. Uh, any other opportunity you know, in the very tone of their voice, it could deflate any joy that I have because I hold them in such high esteem. I am curious how your religious journey has affected your relationship, your familial expectations, your parents' expectations. What has changed when you visit home? When you visit home, are you returning back to the home of that suffocation, that restriction? And this is like, this is where I go to vacation. This is where I go. And then when I go home, I got to get ready back into the barracks, into the army How has your religious sensibility transformed and affected your home and the way that you relate to your parents and Yiddishkeit itself? Me and Moshe had this conversation. We had it one time. What's the most important thing in a relationship? And um, he said communication and I said trust. And I'm starting to I'm starting to go with what he said that it's communication might be more important. So with these meetings that sometimes uh, a lot of things are said without anything being said. And that's the importance of the meeting. Like we call it out and it's like this is a problem for me and it's just communication and it's healthy communication just saying how you feel so I just think communication with your parents like you were saying like how does it feel when you go home do you have to dress up a certain way back when I first came to yeshiva I felt like that's not my home that's my house this is my home back then and because I just didn't feel like I could be me I'm hiding I have contraband in my house that's not my home so it's just communication when my parents give up the fact that like maybe he's doing some things that we don't want him to do but there's communication between us at least I know what he's doing maybe we don't want girls in our house but at least we know where he's at we're not late at night by someone else's house he's here with us and with that communication is how we could build a healthy relationship and how I could eventually grow and Just move on from there. I'm curious for others. This wasn't always the case, so I don't want to make it sound like it's like a perfect life, you know? Because there's always ups and downs. But my parents now are extremely understanding. If I don't want to go to shul, if I don't want to do something at that moment, not even if it's religious, their understanding of it, we have honest conversation. Like if I'm... What did their reaction used to be if you told them? I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. Like maybe like two months back, Shabbos was happening, right? We were making Shabbos Friday night, right? And something happened that bothered me, right? And maybe like two years ago, I would just ignore that, like, or just like go on with the Shabbos meal or even just go and leave the meal. And I called my dad aside and I talked to him. 
and he was so understanding and just the fact that I felt comfortable enough to express that to my parents. Like, I used to never have that relationship with them. I would never even think that that relationship is possible with them. And now, like, I'm able to have honest conversation with them. They're able to understand where I'm at. And it's just a beautiful thing and it's amazing. I like the question a lot. I could say very confidently I've grown a lot here in my time, in my time in Yeshiva. And I think along with that, my parents have grown an incredible amount as well. First of all, communication is just, it's an amazing thing to have. Whether you think it's most important or not, I'm still on the fence about that. But I think it's just an amazing thing to have in a relationship. Either way, open communication. Is there a conversation you had with a parent that you were surprised, like, wow, we're having this, this conversation? I like what Mo said a lot about the home, how like, Okay, and the yeshiva is my home. I go to my house once every two weeks, and that's my house. And there have been conversations, some that I've been uncomfortable having, some that I decided to have, and, and I'm glad I had over the years that really improved the communication and just the general relationship with my parents. And I, and I see that, Baruch Hashem, I see that every day, and I see it with my siblings too. You'll forgive me, and it's only because I can see that there's a lot of layers to this and I'm not asking to plumb to the very depth but allow me to just take the spoon and graze the top of the ice cream container that you have so gracefully displayed in front and I know it's not totally comfortable but I'm curious if you can get in with a little bit more detail of just like what is the conversation that you had where you were surprised by we're having this conversation. You know, I remember the lack of conversation. You know, I just wrote an article. In 12th grade, I went to a Dave Matthews concert with my friends in Saratoga Springs. We rented a limo, and at the concert, one of my friends got arrested. And I told my mother before I left, I said, I'm going out with friends. I'm buying pants for my year in Israel. That's what I told her. And we got boarded a limo. We went to a Dave Matthews concert. A friend got arrested. And I came home the next morning. It was literally like, I don't know, I got in at like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And my mother looked at me with like a little bit of a, a bite. And she said, where are the pants that you bought? Like that was like her, you know, her way of saying, I know it wasn't good wherever you were, but, uh, you know, and I came back. And I felt, I felt the wow of not having the conversation. I'm like, wow, how did we get so distant over all these years that we're not able to talk this out? And I'm curious for you, if you ever had a wow moment, specifics, that like, wow, we are having this conversation. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the specifics. There were definitely a lot of points in my life, especially in my younger teenage years, that I was doing things that my parents knew I was doing. And I knew that they knew that I was doing them. It was no secret but it was not spoken about. And it was like that for a very long time. And I just remember the feeling of relief when it was finally something we could just talk about. And it was a conversation. And it was still, there was still, my parents are, are humans. There's still people and there's still things they had problems with and still I had problems with, still things that I had problems with. And I'm still working on that relationship to this day. But I just remember certain conversations, certain points in time where there were things that weren't being talked about that were that were starting to get opened up. Mo knows how to explain this great, but I gotta say it right now. A relationship with a parent and a kid, it's not us and them. It's a team. Like, it works out together. Like, when you build a house, if they're missing one brick, it won't work. It'll fall apart. A relationship with a parent and a child, it's a team. It's teamwork. We work this out together. We play together. We do it together. Everything is together. It's a team. That's just how I, how I think it has to be. Oh, and it wasn't always that way, necessarily. There were ups and downs. There were struggles, yeah. as I think in everyone's home. I think what he's saying is sometimes I felt this person. I can't speak for him, but in middle school, like when I would get in trouble with the principal, my parents would come in, and it felt like they're on his team, and I'm just alone. And that gives you, like, the vision, like it's you against the world. Yeah. I think it's very important, like, when raising kids and when you have kids that you have to, you're on, you're their teammate. If it has to be teams against each other, it's you guys against the principal. Cause you guys are on the same team. It was good growth from going to feeling like they're against me. Adversarial. Like I could tell them anything and there's no secrets. There's nothing like that. I'm not gonna speak too much in personal experience. I will say that everything they just said is spectacular. And I think that acceptance in a family is fundamental. I think it's, it's one of the most important things that a mother and a father have to look at their kid and be like, I love you for who you are right now. I accept you for whatever you do, whatever you feel, however you act. I think that's fundamental to anyone growing. Just keep that in mind if you're a parent.
the conversation of boundaries to hear the five and obviously all of them could share worlds more sure. and they're capable and all sophisticated they share you know right now what they're comfortable to say to uh, an at-large audience the conversation of boundaries is so crucial the reason I'm like like this you're hitting something mm-hmm. of course we agree to boundaries you heard five people all of them have conversation with family members that are like healthy deep real and these have happen they're all all five you interviewed five guys that have honest conversation like healthy vulnerable back and forth with parents the word relationship connection communication I think somewhere along the way that we put the word boundaries are we talking and connected to our children are their conversation they described in their room their meetings in their friendship they talk to each other and call out each other it's honest conversation of course boundaries Boundaries are necessary. The reason there's such like a kickback here, have our schools become only boundaries and rules? And is there such a thing we could talk within relationship, all of us in our own families? Of course, there are boundaries. Of course, there are rules. I have a simple math equation that rules minus relationship equals rebellion. Mm. So when you talk about boundaries, boundary setting, it's in any relationship, of course, there's a place for boundaries. Nobody's trying to destroy boundaries. We actually create them when we have relationship. In those relationships, there are boundaries and rules within a context of a relationship. We're trying to like put a major focus on relationship, connection, dialogue. Think what this would do to prayer if our own children have conversations conversations with us. Closing and crinkling our eyes is not prayer. Communication with God is conversation. So you're seeing five cool teenagers who talk with each other. They're talking openly to a public and have a lot more to say, but this is a scratch of the surface. When you don't have a relationship with your parents, when you're when you feel like they're against you or whatever, you feel alone because the people who are meant to love you, so like cause I'm saying they're your parents, they're meant to love you you don't feel like you have anyone. Like if the people who are meant to love you don't love you or you don't feel they love you, like how are you supposed to feel love from anyone else if like the people that are meant to don't, you don't feel that way. That's why it's like a really important thing to have communication and feel that they actually care about you. Waterbury is an incredible place. You are an incredible person. Your students are incredible. Are you nervous in the back of your head that Jewish communities are not your yeshiva, you're not the rav in every Jewish community, and eventually they leave this idyllic place with these (sighs) values that are infused everywhere, and they go out into the Jewish world. That could be a lot harsher, a lot more difficult, and a lot of the latent mistakes or struggles that will bubble up again, and you go out into the world, it's not able, it's not necessarily sustainable in the way that we see it over here. There are responsibilities at work, and it's your family life, and you're not going to be the rabbi of every shul across the country. How do you look to your Jura Talmidim, knowing that they're going to leave this place, and you're not going to be able to be with them the whole time? Are you nervous for them? Do you ever have a student who's like, this is not going to... First of all, thank you for your kind words. I think an important point, all the five people that you were to meet, that everybody's been to meet, I'm not a big part of their stories. I'm friends with them. I'm close. We have a good relationship. Their stories inside. Their parents are much more important than I am in their stories. Their own development and own growth is very important. I think and I am extremely confident in our own homes, my own children, one day, your own children will one day get older and leave your home. If there's love and a belief in self and idealism and something you found that will work anywhere in the world. I have seen hundreds of guys, they're out there and it's working and they're building beautiful families, Baruch Hashem. They're involved in their communities. When people find something real, if you force, push, make, so a guy goes out, you're watching people drop, leave, forget. If people find something in you, it's built to last. I'm super confident that a guy who's found something within themselves, yes, is in touch with something, it's built to last. The five you just met will all be successful in every way in their family life, Bez Hashem, community life, they found something. To have guys talk like this at 18, there's no pretend they're underselling, they're not dramatic. To have 18 year olds talk about God like this, talk about relationships, talk about relationship to parents like this, they're feeling some, their own connection to their parents is cool. When you find things like this, this is built to last. This is not about a person, certainly not about me. I'm Zaycha to have a good seat, a back seat to a cool thing going on. 
Khan, but not much more. To see people finding something that's built to last. That is absolutely beautiful. I always wrap up my interviews with more rapid fire questions. I want to start with Rav Kalish. You could each go. I would like each of you to answer the more rapid fire questions. I am curious if there is a book that opened your eyes to kind of this relationship driven approach to Judaism, everything that we've been speaking about today. I prefer if none of you say the Torah or something generic, like an actual book. It could be secular, it could be Jewish. People, it's gay. Safer told us Adam. I would love, it's not being cute. I'd love to give a certain book. Somebody says, so what's the book I can read? I say, meet the youth of today. Meet the youth of today. Anybody else have a... I think there's a, a large number of great books out there. I don't know if it's exactly the type of book you were thinking of, but Think Again is a cool book. Think Again? Do you remember who wrote it? Adam Grant. Oh, great. That's fantastic. Yeah, well, Rabbi Kiddush was saying... I don't really read, but yeah, it's really the people around you. You see people and you see how like happy they are and you really want that. And it's like, wow, I want to become like something like that. I want to be able to connect with people and just feel happy with myself and secure. Beautiful. No book comes to mind for me. I just think I, like, look at, look at yourself in the mirror, like get to know you. You'll learn everything you need to know. If somebody gave you a great deal of money and allowed you to take a sabbatical with no responsibilities whatsoever and go back to school and either get a PhD or write a book, what do you think the subject and title of that PhD or book would be? I don't mean to be cute. It's like somebody gave you money. I still wouldn't leave here for all the money in the world. I do want to say that. No just I have no doubt. I want to say that real because like I said before, watching and being part of this story is better. But the question is still a valuable question. The topic what we're talking about fires me up a lot and I think for Torah to go into deep places in us to live life Yiddishkeit the topic of self-awareness not building walls what analyzing and studying the walls we've already built how do we take down walls we've built already that would be like the topic of the book does anybody else have a title subject matter yeah it would be called the healer the healer yeah and what do you what do you think it would be about you got to stay tuned for that okay <laughs> My final question, I'm always curious about people's sleep schedules. What time do you go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up in the morning? And I am actually quite fascinated with uh, your sleep schedule. <laughs> you're, you're asking that question. I came back 4.30 from a wedding last night. So you're asking it at a tired time. But I would like to be more disciplined to get to sleep at the right time. I definitely tend to go to sleep very late. There are a lot of obligations here and involved in here. So I definitely tend to go to sleep late. I am not the guy at the Vasikan Minion. There's a beautiful 9 o'clock Minion in Avalon that I do frequent from time to time. And... I definitely have my periods when I'm getting up earlier, but I tend to go to sleep late and then wake up for a minion that's not the Vasikin minion. Not far the Vasikin, from it. okay, I appreciate that. General? Obviously, I always fail all the time, but I'm saying I generally go to sleep at around 12 to 12.15 and wake up at 8. Yeah, around 12 o'clock a.m. and then try to wake up like 8.30. I aim for 10 o'clock. But uh, sometimes I'm in bed earlier and sometimes I'm... What time do you wake up? I wake up, like, it depends on the day, really, but, like, I aim for, like, 6 o'clock. Wow, okay. I aim for 10 o'clock. <laughs> Typically, I go to sleep between 10 and 12, and then I wake up between 8.45 and 9 o'clock. I'm glad to say I've been very positively influenced by my roommates, and in this regard, Mo, in particular. I'm not as disciplined as him the going to sleep aspect of it. I do go to sleep much later, but I try to wake up around six-ish. I think it bears like pointing out. We took five growing people and this place called Waterbury, no rules, boundaries, and they're describing 12th graders, cool guys, going to sleep on time and waking up quite early. The six, seven, eight numbers I said to me is like, and the funny parts of like the view of the yeshiva and then coming down and meeting people is people who have schedules, who are organized and coming from within. The long-term perspective to somebody who finds something and what they build and what they create is rather remarkable. And I think their schedule was a great way. It's an excellent question. You've been amazing. Your questions have been spot on. And that point, what that brings out of people when we do trust 
and we do allow people to start building, they'll build something that's beautiful and impressive. And us parents will be very, very impressed and inspired by what's built as we're building with our teenagers and together as teammates with them, they'll build impressive things. Friends, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your thoughts, your story with me today. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. After leaving the yeshiva, which was an incredible experience just to see the students there. And when I say there is diversity among the students, I mean, you really, really see it. You have people who are just in the beginning of their journey. And the beginnings of the journey there means it was the end of a different journey. It means that maybe there was another yeshiva or school that they went to where it didn't work out. Maybe it was a different path that just wasn't working. Or maybe they got pulled over on that prepaved highway by a police officer. You know, (laughs) I hope. I'm speaking allegorically, but they got pulled over on that regular path of that prepaved highway that our generation is all traversing on and said, pull over, we need to speak. But after we left the yeshiva, there were a few people who I didn't get a chance to speak to. And one of them was a dorm counselor, somebody who really began his story in very similar ways to my own. His name is Johnny Aaron. And I wanted to speak to the dorm counselor too, to hear about what the experience in Waterbury is all about. So with that in mind, here is our conversation with with Johnny Aaron. I was having a conversation with somebody and I asked him, why does Waterbury not get in more trouble? I'm going to speak very bluntly and openly. When I walked to the yeshiva, I saw people who were not wearing yarmulkes, who were vaping, who were, you know, chilling. And it's very easy to love a yeshiva from the distance. And when you get there, I have no issue with any of this. I identify with the students there. But I asked this person who's more centrally located the yeshiva world. Why does nobody ever pick on Waterbury? I get picked on. 1840 gets picked on. How come Waterbury never gets picked on? So he said something very interesting. He said Waterbury is seen as like the burn unit, the trauma ward for the yeshiva system. And that's why. I wanted to begin by asking you, you're a dorm counselor in the yeshiva. Do you agree with that? Do you think Waterbury should be seen as the burn unit of the yeshiva system, the trauma ward? You know, this is only for people who weren't able to make it elsewhere. So we have this special place where they can can kind of be rehabilitated. How do you see the work of what Waterbury is doing? First, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, it's an interesting remark you're making about not getting in trouble, getting in trouble, not getting enough. The first thing that's coming to mind is something that the Lubavitch Rebbe always said. The Lubavitch Rebbe, of course, always had a very positive outlook. And in Hebrew, a hospital is referred to as a bet cholim, a house of sick. He was famous for calling it a bet refua, a house of healing. So as far as the Shiva does get in trouble, it, it gets a lot of hate mail, whatever, call it what you want. I would be quicker to call the yeshiva a bet refua than a bet cholim. It's a house of healing. It's a house of building. It's not just a place of, oh, difficulties have struck. Let me go here now. Everyone has difficulties. So the question is, is, are you in touch with that? And are you going to build upon your previous pain and struggles and your current life? Or are you just going to say, eh, you know what? I don't need that. I don't have to build upon it. Just power through. I love that answer. There is a big difference. And I, I remember vaguely that insistence of Lubavitcher Rebbe of calling hospitals a Beit Rufua, a place of healing, and not, you know, the trauma ward, not a place of sickness and crisis. I think that analogy is very apropos, and I saw it with my own eyes. I'm curious, from your experience as a dorm counselor, what do you think is the central issue that people need healing from? What healing is needed? They all go to great yeshivas. The Jewish day school system has never never been stronger. So what is it that anybody would even need healing from? I have a lot of friends, Baruch Hashem, my age, older, younger, guys that I'm close with. I can't necessarily answer for them. I could just share with you a little bit about myself and my earlier years. I went to a Jewish day school in the Five Towns area, probably a different track than what most guys in Waterbury went to growing up, a different style of... Most guys come from a little bit more yeshivish institutions, a little bit more right-wing, and you were kind of from the centrist Orthodox community. Yeah, I guess that's fair to say. In broad strokes, okay. So everyone's upbringing definitely different. I think that's a huge credit to the yeshiva and Rabbi Kalish is that there are guys that come from all walks of life, from the New York metro area, Florida, Texas, California, Israel, South Africa, Chicago, Arizona, Canada. There's a wide range of people that come to the yeshiva. It's not a one-track type of guy. So just... I think, first of all, just the positivity that you're welcome here, that you're invited here, that you have a place here. And from there, I want to sort of give you, you know, a response to your question. I'm definitely not a low energy person. People that know me, I'm a very high energy person. Not so easy for me to sit still. But if you have my attention, I could sit for hours. 
So in elementary school, we weren't really a good show. You know, you have 25 kids in a class. The job of the teacher isn't necessarily to, you know, obviously it's to educate, but often the teacher, if not, you know, really congruent with self, it's not always about teaching you. It's about making sure you listen to me. So when you have that riff in a classroom of a kid that doesn't want to listen and a teacher that needs to be listened to, it doesn't necessarily work. What Waterbury gives and what Rebbe Kalish gives, for me, it gave me a place. The biggest thing that Waterbury and Rebbe Kalish gave me is me. How many people are going through the Jewish day schools and the yeshiva system with no sense of self? Okay, do this, go to this yeshiva for X amount of years, make it to this person's shear, get this shidduch with this father-in-law to pay these bills. For what? Who are you doing it for? What am, am I a person? What am I? The biggest thing that Waterbury is giving is a sense of self. So how many of us have been robbed of just not being a person? I could say for me, I didn't, a per, I, I have a right, I have a place, I'm a person, well, I'm not just another person in the classroom. What Rabbi Kalish and Waterbury is giving is community, connection, love. I could love, I'm capable of loving, I'm worthy of love, respect. The respect in the yeshiva is we just finished a summer program. It's not that there aren't the words to explain it. It's that I've seen this with my rabbi and my friends. We just lose oxygen when we try to explain what's going on. Let me ask you another question because I didn't mention it enough, but it really struck me. There is a word that Rabbi Kalish, I believe he said he banned from his yeshiva. He doesn't allow one word to be used. It's not a curse word, though I'm sure he doesn't curse, but that's not the word on the ban list. There's one word that he bans. I don't know if he says this often. Do you know what word I'm talking about? I'm thinking of two. Tell me your two and I'll tell you what I was thinking of. Well, I feel like you're going to say potential, but I was hoping you're going to say schlep. So I was thinking of potential and I'd love to hear about schlep, but I was shocked that he said, we don't talk about potential here because to me, it dovetails to a lot of what you just said. Rabbi Kalish told me in Waterbury, we don't talk about potential. And what I noticed is, you know, growing up, I had a lot of potential. I was told a lot about my potential. Why? Why is the word potential not used in the education system in Waterbury? I appreciate what you're bringing up. And just like seeing you on the screen, like <laughs> you're excited. You're sincerely excited bringing this up. I want to answer with a personal experience. Like I said, the type of elementary school I went to, my mother always keeps pictures and arts and crafts. For some reason, she kept my report cards from the earlier years. I'm thinking of my English teacher in first grade and second grade, and she kept the report cards. And there was like a common theme, the common theme in all the notes from the teachers. But more importantly, there was two grades, right? Math, social studies, science, Hebrew. Sure. There was grade, one category, and effort, another category. So if you looked at my grades in first, I don't think I'm like a dumb guy. I think I'm pretty smart. If you look at the grade in like the earlier years, they were very weak, incomplete, not very good, F, whatever it was. Yeah. But effort was like excellent, very good, amazing. Jonathan, Johnny has excellent potential. When he uses his focus for the right things and puts his mind to doing something, he's amazing. Translation, when he's conforming and listening to me and he's not acting out of the classroom, he could do whatever I tell him. In Waterbury, in the eyes of Rabbi Kalish, it's the exact opposite. We don't judge you on your grade. What's your effort? What are you putting in? Where are yeshiva of Tocho Kibaro? That's it. I mean, your outsides need to match your insides. That's it. The biggest thing is your effort. If you put in the effort, we say every day in Berchus Torah, La Sok B'Divrei Sora. We don't say to understand the Torah. Now, of course, there's a madrig of understanding and sure. deepening getting more. But the ichor is the toil. The most important thing here is putting in the work, is grinding. So what Rabbi Kielish is saying with potential is, oh, sadical. Oh, you'll get there one day. What do you mean? You're there today. You put on film today. That's amazing. Let's go. That's eternal and forever. The potential means is you could get there one day as opposed to you're there right now. Let's add a little bit more. That's exactly why I asked you because, you know, we talk so much in 1840 about the interiority, your inner self, the inner world that people are grappling with. And I think very often communally, even if we don't use the term, communally we think in terms of potential, what you're going to become. And educationally, to center the notion of where you are and what you've already accomplished, what you already represent, and who you are, your sense of self as a person, which is exactly what you responded to my first question, kind of bringing out, letting people feel comfortable with their very sense sense of self is everything that goes against let's just focus on potential potentials have got a nice thing but you could get potential to death in this world where you never feel like you're anywhere in the present let me ask you you mentioned a second word i'm a little curious you mentioned the word schlep which is a yiddish term to mean like a headache you gotta i gotta schlep to a wedding i have to schlep to a chasana i have to schlep there schlep here why was that your second guess you got the first guess right i didn't know the second word what's the issue with the word schlep 
Chris, I'm just excited that you asked me. I also feel a little bit like cheating. Like, let Rabbi Kalish be here and explain it. He could explain it much better we than me. We have plenty of time with Rabbi Kalish. I'm just a reporter. I'm not like, I'll explain to you, Schlepp, and I'll literally an example. From, I, I had one of the best days of my life yesterday, and I'm going to explain to you why it wasn't a Schlepp and why I'm going on a long drive again today. We just finished the summer program near Lake George for three weeks. It was amazing. It was just exceptional. And I'm looking at about a four hour drive back from Lake George, back to the five towns area. And somebody asked me, hey, can you drive me to the airport? I was supposed to take the bus, but the bus is late. I said, sure, you're a good friend. Of course, I'd love to take you to the airport. You have to make your flight back home. He lives in Arizona. Good friend of mine, Benjamin. So we start driving, but before we hit the highway, we got to stop at a gas station, right? Go to a gas station, get a nice coffee, get a snack. We drive an hour, take a rest stop, have a baseball catch. I actually met a Jew at this rest stop, the craziest story in the world. He actually was involved in like a big brother, little brother program over 10 years ago where I live. And he was my guy. I haven't seen him <laughs> in over 10 years. His wife and three children. He lives in Miami. Now, just crazy. Ashkafen. Amazing. Okay. Drive another hour, make another stop, see more friends, get together, make another stop in Queens. I wanted to get him food before his flight, drop him off at the airport, come home. What's a four hour drive? Took like I don't know, six and a half hours. Sounds like a schlep to me. Why is that word not the word? Because we're not a yeshiva of destination. We're a yeshiva of the journey. One of my favorite books in the world is Judah Michelle's Badera. And I've never finished a book and I don't plan on finishing the book because that's the book. The book itself is just being along the path. Specifically when Rebecca Kalish says schlep is, oh my goodness, I have a wedding in Baltimore. I have to drive four hours. It's such a schlep. So if you slept to the wedding, then it's going to take you four hours. and It's going to feel like eight. I got home yesterday. I couldn't sit still. My body was jittering. I told my mother, mom, it felt like five minutes. That's it. I'm doing it again. Today, I'm going to Baltimore just to hang out with a friend. I'm going to Baltimore and come right back because I just want to hang out with him. A schlep is, is, oh my goodness, I have to get there already. I have to get there already. A journey is, is, hey, let's stop at the rest stop. I've been on countless rides, countless, countless rides with Rebbe Kalish from Connecticut to weddings in New York to him speaking different events. And Baruch Hashem, we have a very close relationship and I've expressed different things to him. But I, one thing I, I said to him is if, if I was to be asked, what do you think it was like to travel with the Baal Shem Tov in the wagon when he <laughs> went on his trip? I would say I know exactly what it feels like. The Jews and the people that I've encountered with Rebbe Kalish on our trips from Waterbury to Lakewood for a wedding, stopping at a gas station, davening a mincha, playing frisbee, playing punch ball, buying food. It's not, okay, we have to get there already. We have to get there already. No, no, no. Let's just enjoy this time in this moment right now. We're a journey. The yeshiva's a journey. It's so fascinating that you say that because it's really the same point that you're making about potential where, you know, you could look at your life as just a series of schleps because, you know, you have to get someplace else. You have the, another potential that you need to extract. And if you look at all of life as a schlep, as I have to go here, I have to go there, there's never a moment where you feel at peace or that enjoyment, that opportunity that lies literally in the present moment in front of you. And I think that notion, it relates to me so much because I look at everything as a schlep. I don't like leaving my house. I don't like going down the block. I don't like, I don't like going everywhere. Everywhere's a schlep for me. It reorients what a journey could be, what you can do on a path with somebody together. You know, Rabbi Kalish mentioned to me the first time we spoke and maybe you could corroborate it. He told me that on these journeys, and I kind of believe him now because he always comes with an entourage, he comes with people who are singing. He comes with people who are playing music together when we interviewed him we interviewed students together he told me that he has played 1840 on car rides can you corroborate that that is in fact true he told you already you don't need me to confirm have you been in the car when he's listening i personally have been in the car listening to 1840 sure when you listen to other people in the car how does he do it man i'm not just asking about 1840 is he stopping and highlighting points for the guys, is he just like letting it go? People are schmoozing. What's the vibe in that, you know, Balshemtov's wagon when you're listening together, especially to a podcast? It's not a sheer. I'm not giving over like a formal Mara Macomos. You're listening to a conversation. So I'm just curious when you're on these non schlep journeys together, how does he conduct the van? I want to comment on the yeshiva and tie it into the van. If I had to sum up the yeshiva, it's a mindful, present yeshiva. But I think. Throughout our conversation right now, you could sense that it's about the journey, it's about now, it's about being in the moment, it's about being present. There's a huge focus on being true to yourself, to being honest, to being real, to being you. Of course, the famous story with Reb Zusha when he's on his deathbed. That's the story of the issue. Be your you. Be your best you. Just for our listeners that Reb Zusha said, I'm not worried that they're going to ask me, why weren't you like the great rabbis, Moshe Rabbeinu, prophets? I'm worried that they're going to ask me, why couldn't you be Zusha? I'm worried about becoming me. But Kalish is, he's one of those massive, like, mobile, like, energy banks. 
that like they use to power up concerts when they're on the road. <laughs> that being said, there's no remote control on it. It's very organic. We'll listen to something in the car. Present. There's a lot of presence. Somebody will pipe up. That was so interesting. What did he say? Somebody will make a comment. Somebody will ask a question. Somebody might explain it. There's not a lot of forced chills in these environments. They're generally, not generally, they are always just natural and flowing. There's no, here's another word, agenda. The agenda is just just let it roll. Just let it be. Just be present. See how it hits you. See how it hits you. And I think there's no greater way to find yourself than stop becoming so distracted by potential and allow that organic connection that we all have, that decency, that elevatedness, and that inspiration that resides in all of us. If we stop focusing on the schlep and start focusing on where we are now, which is everything that you and the yeshiva and the students there represent, we could finally come back home. You asked me when you came to the yeshiva, the sheer was so powerful, and Rebecca Kalish has a lot of listeners. Why don't you put like a nice hush of microphone with like one of those nets in front of him? Yeah. Set up a camera. He right? has a terrible setup. It's terrible. terrible. I have a better setup than he does. I don't even have such a good setup. That's right. What's the answer to that question? What I answered to you then is because Rebecca Kalish isn't giving sheer to the hundreds or thousands of people listening on their mobile devices throughout the world. He's giving sheer on a rainy Sunday afternoon in January to the 12 people that have come to the base measures on a Sunday. I want to add more to that. What I realize is by giving sheer to the 12 people who are currently, or on a day, it could be 60 people or 40 people. He's giving sheer to a thousand people. If he gives me the information and he gives the information to the person next to me and we go and we spread that to 20 people and 50 people and they spread that to 20 people or 100 people or whatever it is, this is a big focus on what the yeshiva is. We're not for imitation connection. We're not for how does it look? Okay, I want to feel this. That's why in the world we're running for imitation connection because we're dying for real connection. So he could go on a fancy screen and a big hush of microphone and somebody listening to the sheer in Tennessee Tune will hear it live. Yeah. yeah, and they'll, they'll hear it live and they'll feel so connected. It's not it. We want the real connection. And this is what Rebbe Kalish, I'm, I feel like he explained it about Shabbos to experience Shabbos. Better for me to impact 10 people really, really strong and they can go and share that than for me to loosely like impact you like, oh, I heard a recording when I was like traveling through like an airport. He's speaking to me. And that's what the yeshiva is. That's who he is. He's speaking to me. I've texted him so many times, Rebbe, I feel like when you give sheer, you're just talking to me and everybody else is eavesdropping. I can almost guarantee you most people in the room feel that. That when he's speaking in, in a public forum, he's just talking to me. That's how I'm on fire. That's how the yeshiva is on fire. That's how the people are on fire. Because there's authenticity. There's connection. There's how it is. It doesn't always look pretty, but there's how it is. And this is how it is. This is what's true. Johnny, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your thoughts today. It means so much to me, and I hope that we continue to stay in touch. The yeshiva Waterbury is really well known for their singing. They've produced a bunch of albums, and when I came into the Bass Medrash, that time that I visited the yeshiva, they were fully set up, they had guitars there, and singing is a central part of the way that they really find and reconcile their own story with the larger story of the Jewish people, and it's incredibly moving. I want to take a page, in a way, out of Rev. Daniel Kalish's playbook and play some of those songs because I think they're such an important part of the process of finding yourself, finding ways to attach yourself into the larger story of the Jewish people. Their songs, in some ways, are very modern. Uh, guitar progression, the chords, even the vocals can feel very modern. It feels like, you know, the alt-rock that I grew up with. But in a way, in a larger way, in a more essential way, they are deeply religious. They are deeply Jewish. They are deeply personal about people finding themselves and finding their own story within the larger story, within the larger words of the Jewish people. And there's one song that they played actually when they came to that NCSY event that has always stuck with me. It's not really a high holiday song. It's actually a Lag Omer song. I want to listen to a little bit of it. It's based on the words that we sing in one of the poems associated with Lag Omer that says, Bimaras Tzurim Sha'amarata Sham Kanisa Hodcha Vehadarecha. In this narrow cave, kind of the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, when he ran away and studied in a cave for 12 years, in the narrow straits of this cave that I stood, that is where I acquired your glory and your radiance. It was specifically hiding in a cave alone by yourself that I was able to really find and discover your, referring to God's, radiance and glory, hod vehadar, again, loosely translated, glory, radiance, and 
I heard this live. It's also a, a song you could find it on YouTube. It's called Stone Cave. But the opening is very beautiful. And I want you to listen to a little bit of that song now. They found mysteries they grew to understand. Stone cave, that pain where you endure was not in vain. You pulled through and you grew from those challenges you gained. Be more eyes to him. Share my it's a beautiful song and i remember when i was listening to this like it really struck me it is very unusual to see a rabbi traveling with a band i mean i would love a band to travel with me when i go to speak it would be wonderful at the very least an acapella group when i go away on shabbos if anybody's interested to come along with me but it's not shtick it is deeply sincere and it is deeply real And I think that what it's all about is the ability, particularly through song, to find both the voice, the instruments, and the lyrics, and find a coherence among them, to take something that's old, very often the lyrics include something that can be a poem from centuries ago, if not thousands of years ago, adding your own lyrics to it, and then bringing your voice to it, is taking something that almost doesn't belong to you, taking a lyric, taking a poem, and then making it yours, and in a way... When you sing together, which is such a central part of the Shiva of Waterbury, singing itself is an act of reconciliation. When you sing, especially when you sing on key and you play on key with instruments and different people are singing together, you are reconciling different chords, voices, lyrics all together to form a cohesive whole, which is why I think singing itself is a form of teshuva. You are taking lyrics that very often, usually you didn't write or a portion of them you didn't write, You're adding voices to them, not only your own, but with others. And you're adding instrumentation. And when all of these come together, it is an act of musical reconciliation where all of the disparate parts can form a cohesive whole. It's why I believe when we talk about Shira in the Torah, when we talk about song in the Torah, in Parshas Hazinu, it actually introduces it with vi'ata, the, the Hebrew word, and now, kisvu lachem es hashira hazos. And now, vi'ata, and now, write for yourselves a song. Write for yourself a song. And of course, it's referring there to the song of the Torah itself, either Parshas Hazinu, or as the Rambam says, the entire Torah is called a Shira. But it is introduced with vi'ata, and now what is the and now what why right now what, what is the word va'ata, that introductory word telling us so the medrash actually tells us a principle which is so beautiful which is ein viata elalashon tshuva whenever there is that urgency and now you need to do that it is a call of repentance of tshuva of return why is writing the torah down as a song an act of teshuva and i believe the idea is and you see this with your eyes open, if you ever visit the Yeshiva Waterbury, if you ever have the privilege to hear of Daniel Kalish speak, and you should, he has an incredible WhatsApp group that shares so many of his shiurim, so many of his ideas, it's worth getting into it and to hear it. But the reason why singing, and specifically why the notion of the Torah as song is introduced with the word vi'ata, and now, and that word always symbolizes tshuva, because singing itself is an act of reconciliation. And I believe that helping people find that song within their lives, that song of teshuva, to reconcile all of the lyrics, some of which you've written, some of which we've written, some of which other people have written, some of which have been written generations ago, and reconciling
following your path to that old highway of lyrics, to that old highway of living, in many ways, you know, for me, represented by my father and Rev. Daniel Kalish's father, and finding a way to reconcile yourself not only to lyrics that may not belong to you, but in a larger way to find and make Jewish tradition, Jewish life, Jewish commitment, make it yours, make it personal, is what singing and the reconciliation of singing is all about which is why it's introduced, the Ata and now, Kisvu Lechem Es Hashira Hazos. You want to learn how to do Teshuva? You want to learn how to reconcile life and tradition and Jewish living and make it yours and make it personal? Write a song. Make Torah into a song to reconcile all of the disparate lyrics and voices and instruments that each of us play and each of us have had within our own lives and find a way to reconcile and find healing and joy and inspiration within our Jewish lives. And before we conclude, and you'll forgive me if it's a little bit longer, but I wanted to leave with one final song that we'll play as we do the outro. And it's a song that's all about developing that personal relationship with God, with Jewish life, even after you struggled, even after you've been in those narrow straits. And it's a song by Waterbury, probably their most well-known song, and it's called Tati My King, which is about somebody developing and finding a way to relate to God, to godliness, and to Yiddish as a parent, as a loving parent, and somebody who is nurturing you and helping you grow. And it's with that song I'd like to leave because I believe that if we've ever had a song of tshuva, of that vi'ata kisu lochemes hashira hazos, right now with tshuva, transforming Torah into song, there's no more appropriate song to enter into the high holidays than the song of Avinu Malkenu, which we say throughout the high holidays, my father, my king, but not just saying it, but singing it together. I was told to speak to you, Hashem Maybe you can tell me who I am I've been lost too long to know where I belong In the end, my only hope is that you'd hold my hand How am I supposed to see your path With so many questions I have to ask Now I'm standing here alone I'm losing hope And in the end My tears are falling to Hashem So Tati, my king, Father, I plead, don't ever let, ever let go of me, ever let, ever let go of me. I need you to realize that I'm lost in my life, so pick me up, help me stand, don't let go of my hand. Tati, my king. So thank you so much for listening, and thank you again to our series sponsors, Mira and Daniel Stokar, for sponsoring the entire Teshuva series. Your friendship means so much to me. And thank you again to our anonymous sponsor. I hope that you get to listen to this episode, and I hope I didn't give away your identity, but I really do appreciate you. And I'm going to say it briefly in this outro, but in a lot of ways, your story, it really inspires me. I don't know that I ever told you that, but I I do want you to know that your story really inspires me. And in a lot of ways, everything that we spoke about today is really embodied by what you've done and what you've created with yourself and your life and your businesses. And I just want you to know, nobody knows who I'm talking to, but I really find you to be incredible inspiring. This episode was edited by our dearest friend, Dina Emerson. Thank you so much, Dina, and it's great to have you back. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our episodes, please subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends about it. You can also donate at 1840.org slash donate. It really helps us reach new listeners and continue putting out great content. You can also leave us a voicemail with feedback or questions that we may play in a future episode. That number is 917-720-5629. Please reach out. We're way overdue for a listener feedback episode. Again, that number is 917- 
917-720-5629. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or some of the other great ones we've covered in the past, be sure to check out 1840.org. That's the number 18, followed by the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y dot org, where you can also find videos, articles, recommended readings, and weekly emails. Thank you so much for listening, and stay curious, my friends. I'm starting to realize that you've held me so tight I'll follow your plan, just don't let go of my hand And I'll take my cake, Father, I played Don't ever let, ever let go of me Ever let, ever let go of me Ever let, ever let